30 seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. He's a violin prodigy. Her full name is Maggie V. Stallion. They are Maggie and Perloff on CBS Sports Radio. Well, Shohei Otani left no gray area. Welcome to the show, Maggie Gray, Andrew Perloff. Yes, no gray area, Perloff. He came out yesterday, 12 minutes. Uh, some prepared marks. Some look like maybe went off the cuff a little bit. And he said in no uncertain terms, I haven't bet on sports. Yeah. I never used an illegal bookmaker. My interpreter was stealing all this money for me. And I never knew my interpreter was gambling or had all these gambling debts. Yeah, if I think it was a completely satisfactory answer by him in this sense. Now he's putting it out there. If anybody can prove that he was sports betting or that he knew about the wire transfers, go ahead and get him. Like, what else could you ask for out of the press conference? He had all the rope to hang himself. So if you don't trust... Shohei Otani, which I think a lot of people don't. Well, now he's letting everyone uh, have a, a chance to prove him wrong, and the feds are going to interview all these people too. So I think I give him credit in the sense that if he's telling the truth, he did the exact right thing, and if he's lying, we're going to get him. Yeah, that's true. He did put himself out there, and again, like you can't say, and I can't take from Otani, if something comes back and Otani actually did bet on a game here or there, or might have known that Ipe, his and translator, was in all this trouble with gambling. I can't hear a lost in translation thing, right? And I know he had a different translator there yesterday, someone else who works for the Dodgers, but that can no longer be an excuse. There were a lot of things that I think slipped through the cracks, especially with how this story first came out. And I think we were willing to forgive, oh, they're in South Korea. There's a translator. The translator is lying. He's the the crux of the story. He's the bad guy here. Uh, at first he was not. Then he became the bad guy. And it was like all this gray yeah. and just sort of, you know, there was just a lot of questions. You can't have any questions now. If any part of mm -hmm. this ends up not being true, what Shohei said, he definitely put his stake down in the ground. Yep. This I'm a victim here, like, and I feel, and I'm I'm shocked, and I'm sad, and I, you know, my my friend has betrayed me. He is camped out in his corner, and if one part of this ends up not being true, I think it makes him look really, really bad. So he took a major risk, I thought yesterday, in not leaving any like well, any wiggle room. You say a risk that yeah, implies some form of guilt. If he really is innocent, then it's not a risk. Right. So that's, I mean, obviously there, I think, let's get into for a second. What are the logistical questions we have? What were the mechanics of the wire transfer? That's why I think that's the biggest risk he faced is that he's saying I was completely ignorant of this. I don't know. I've never done a wire transfer. I don't know exactly how it works, but it seems like there's many layers. It's hard to believe that this guy was doing wire transfers without some form of consent from Shohei. Now he obviously, if, if Shohei is telling the truth, he lied about what the wire transfers were. He didn't even but, know about the wire transfers. He said right. he didn't know any of this stuff. Right, right, right. That's why you could get him on that. That To me, that's the most vulnerable spot for Shohei. I don't believe that he's ever been in a casino betting on. I don't think anyone's going to find a video of him at a, at a craps table in Vegas. Or, or what, Actually, that's fine. He yeah, never right. said craps table in Vegas is, is I, totally normal. I don't think Shohei would go out there and say it. If he was really a gambling addict, wouldn't there be evidence other than this? Wouldn't there be other stories? It feels like he's pretty confident that no one's going to catch me sports betting, which makes me believe, well, maybe he wasn't actually sports betting. Listen, and I think he maybe has earned the benefit of the doubt. I, yeah, we don't know anything about Shohei Otani <laughs> yeah. in, in this country. Like him personally. <laughs> Remember how, what, a, what a struggle it was to find out what the name of his dog was? Like His marriage came out of nowhere, and no one even understood what was going on. Yeah, I mean, listen, you want to keep that part private, but the fact we didn't even know, we've never seen a woman, anyone, like, I, yes, there's so many things about him that are private. So it's, I like, I don't know if that gives him the benefit of the doubt or doesn't 
for some people, I think it does give them the benefit of the doubt. Like, hey, we have no reason to suspect him. And I think for others, it's like, we don't know anything about this guy. And how is a bookmaker lending, you know, you know lines of credit to somebody who, you know, right. th- did, did the translator tell the bookmaker, hey, I have access to Shohei Otani's bank account? I mean, they're not blood relatives. I know they had this great relationship, I- but... They're not blood. I don't See, know. See, I disagree with you on that. I think they're closer than blood relatives. He was Shohei's window into this country right. in many ways. So I, I have a lot of relatives who I barely talk to. Right. This guy, in the sense of because of the language thing, I think he's way closer than a brother or a sister because Shohei relied on him for so much. I mean, it, I don't know how much English Shohei uh, knows, but that interpreter could have screwed with Shohei many times over the years. Say... I'm going to make this is it's not a funny situation at all, but say there Shohei and the interpreter were both single and they were at a bar and two women came up. Yeah. You don't think that interpreter is sort of massaging the, what the girls are saying. So he gets the prettier one. I mean, <laughs> I'm just saying, Ben, I just think interpreters, well, EJ and I got started talking about the bachelor this morning. Oh, yeah, so cloud your brain. Uh, but basically I just think the interpreter is a huge part of his life. And I, I think it's closer than family. He really, he's in the perfect position to steal money from this guy. Yeah, I mean, you no. can't possibly have a better situation. I guess it was like a perfect storm. And for a guy, if you believe everything that Shohei's saying, it was a perfect storm for a guy who was a bad actor. The interpreter was a bad actor that he has you know, been lying, been cheating, all of that. I guess if you're talking about mechanics of other things I want to know, I want to know how he did get access to the bank account. Is he paying Shohei Otani's bills? Is that how he got access to it? Is he the guy? Like, you know, we know he's like a... His driver, uh, they yeah. worked out together, the dog walker. I mean, it's a leap to go from those things to, and also he's the one who's like taking care of my mortgage. <laughs> yeah, but it's not that big a leap. He Look at the wide range of things he did. He was a catcher in the home run derby. He's the interpreter. I didn't even know he was the dog walker, yeah. but it does seem like, what is he not doing? I mean, it's not that far of a leap to say that he'd have access to his bank accounts. I'll bet you Shohei, okay, what if Shohei gets an email in English? Uh, you don't think that he ever put Ipe on the computer and said, answer this for me or something like that? It does seem he was re- heavily involved in this guy's life. Totally. Listen, we're talking about the Shohei Otani did his press conference yesterday, 12 minutes, mostly read from a paper, but also at the end of the press conference, you know, basically was looking right into the camera from people who are, and, and speaking, it seemed like from the heart, people who are in the room have basically said they thought he was getting emotional at the end when he was talking about the betrayal um, that he feels like he's experienced now with Ipe and and that he came across as being very genuine in those moments when he wasn't reading from the paper. Um, It's okay. I'm not naive to know that athletes and famous people and not famous people, but generally famous people and famous athletes and rich people get money stolen from them by people who are close to them. I totally understand that. But you want to tell me that you spend this amount of time with a guy, right? Mm -hmm, Again, mm -hmm. the driver, the catcher at the all-star game, the dog walker, all the things he does. And Shohei says he never knew this guy was a gambler at all, let alone the debts. You have no clue. And I know people can be manipulative and people can be so deceptive. And I get that. But you're spending this much time basically like a relative yeah. or like a second, like a work spouse, you know, like work, work husband, work wife. Right. No clue that this guy's gambling to the point where he would rack up seven figures in debt. Well, that I mean, that's not that much in gambling debt. I feel uh, yeah, people are talking about that. Different people. People are talking about that number like it's crazy. Uh, if this bookie knew that Shohei was right over his shoulder, I'm sure he was happy. I disagree with people say, oh, well, why do you let a translator rack up four hundred, uh, four and a half million dollars debt? Right. Well, obviously, th- th- this bookie is not to be trusted and knew he could manipulate the situation. Uh, but regardless, I-, I do think that it's very plausible to me. I don't know what some of my friends are betting. I have no idea. No, but it's such a big part of Ipe's life, right? Is and- it, though? I mean, I think... Do we know that Ipe, how how long had he been doing this? There's still a lot of mystery. I mean, it's pretty easy to lose money gambling and no, really, really fast. No, I get it. But that's a that's a big number to a lot of people. It's a really, mm. maybe not to you, maybe not to, you know, people. Why? Well, yeah, four and a half million <laughs> to me. <laughs> no, you don't I, think that's a big number? 45 is a big number to well, me. Well, that's what I'm saying. And like, I just take, for example, in our own lives, and I know that our lives are not like Shohei Otani's life, but we make bets, $10 whatever it is. And we talk about it all the time because Mm. you get invested in your bets. Like people want it. You end up talking about it when you're at lunch 
around the water cooler, whatever it is. And I'm just surprised that Shohei would say he had no idea that Ipe was into sports gambling. But the the former Jaguars employer I keep coming back to, he he deceived everyone for years and lost twenty one million dollars and he didn't have Shohei over his court. Right. I he I was think using that, a company credit card though. Like that was a tiny He bit got different. away with it for years. Yeah. No one around him. I mean, listen, he yeah, but he was flying private jets and none of his friends or fellow coworkers were calling him out on that for a long, long time. I just think that gamblers can hide things. I think addicts yeah. can hide things. I think people can hide things. I tend to believe that we don't really know anybody. (laughs) So, and even this guy close to him, it is conceivable. What I like about Shohei, you will admit, though, that Shohei put it out there now. Now there's no gray area. If we catch him doing anything, then Shohei sort of set this up uh, to get him kicked out of the game, which I know I said yesterday, MLB will protect him any way they can because he's the meal ticket for the sport right now. No doubt. But now Shohei kind of ended that because he said, I never bet. Now if anyone can prove he bet, then it's over for him. The other thing too, if if he is showing such a big better, wouldn't there be other other bets going on? Wouldn't there be other people who knew Shohei bet? Wouldn't he bet with a different bookie? Wouldn't he bet legally in Vegas at some point? If he had this kind of problem, isn't there going to be some other kind of evidence trail? Well, that's what I'm saying about the translator. Yeah, I don't know how Shohei could say I had no idea when you're in it this much. Isn't it a part of your life that people might pick up on? But maybe the translator was doing it all in English and Shohei really didn't understand it. It's true. It's possible a million different ways. Now, there's another part of this um, that I thought was kind of interesting, and I'm curious if you think so as well. Pete, can we play cut four, please? This is Shohei from yesterday. So this is a little of the TikTok of when ESPN and the LA Times got a hold of the story, the story being that a bookmaker in uh, Southern California got busted, and the feds are investigating, and then found some wire transfers that had Shohei Otani's name on it. So here we go. Now the reporters are on the trail, and Shohei says uh, his translator, Ipe, never told him about a media inquiry, like a request that came in about the betting story. Last weekend in Korea, um, media has reached out to a representative in my camp um, inquiring about my my potential involvement in this sports betting. Ipe never revealed to me that there was this media media inquiry. Okay, you want to know who else got a media inquiry? The Dodgers and Shohei's agency, which is CAA, uh, Creative Arts. Why did anybody from any of those other places, like the Dodgers or like CAA, why didn't they go to Shohei at that time and say, hey, we got this massive story that you might be linked to that could be coming down the pike. We got to talk about this. And instead, they continued to go to Ipe. Not only that, somehow one of Shohei's representatives like allowed Ipe to talk to ESPN's investigative unit for 90 minutes. Why didn't anyone go to the source of Shohei himself? You have other people who speak Japanese on the team. I don't know if they were with him in South Korea. I assume this is the man yesterday who was Ipe's, uh, excuse me, Shohei's new translator. David Sampson, the former president of the Marlins, is going to join us in about 30 minutes. This is what I want to know from David Sampson. Why didn't anybody from the Dodgers, why did the team still sit back and not go to Shohei directly and say, either with the translator or not, we got to get in a room with you and ask you about this situation. We can't just let Ipe do an interview Mm. with ESPN's investigative unit. I don't get that. It seems obvious to me, though, the Dodgers had no idea what was going on. They didn't understand the situation. Okay, but are they, shouldn't they have? I have, I mean, this, you're, you're giving, first of all, you're giving the Dodgers a lot of credit. There was clearly a lot of haze around this story. No, I don't think... Maybe they should have, but we don't really know what they knew. It's not like they said they I'm not sure the Dodgers willfully volunteered this guy up to the press. I don't think they understood what was happening. Also, they were in Korea, right? Yeah. There was a lot going on. The season was about to start. I'm sure that they did not get a handle on the story until it was way too late. Oh, well, that's obvious. <laughs> yeah. They definitely did. But, but I think when I think of the Dodgers, I don't think of the Mets. You know, the Mets to me are a bumbling, stumbling franchise that I'm unfortunately a fan of, and they will always mm. screw this kind of thing up. To me, the Dodgers, I know they're not perfect, but oh they are God. one of the gold standard teams. I put the Dodgers up there with the New York Yankees as the type of teams that have the money and the resources and want to do things in a certain way and you had the entire Dodgers contingent who's in South Korea so you had the front office who was there you had plenty of people who 
like this is not an inquiry about your backup third baseman. You know, this is ESPN and the LA Times coming coming with major questions about your star player. How, that cannot slip through the cracks. I think the Dodgers mm. look terrible here. I I don't know. I I think they have the same problem. The the translator like they don't. It's not a normal player because he has a guy who's speaking for him. I think there's a lot of mess. And also the Dodgers. The Dodgers have a really dicey last twenty years. The whole Frank McCourt thing. Like there's a lot going. Well, no, they it's think like the that, Trevor Bauer. And by the thing. the other thing too, the yeah. Yankees are also. I don't know if the Yankees have everything under control either. <laughs> I, well, I think you're giving them way too much credit. I think they have the same translation problem that a lot of people are. In the movie Lost in Translation. Uh, reminds me of it. It's imagine if we had a coworker here who had a translator. You think that that person we're going to be able to communicate as easily as the other people? No, but I would imagine if all of a sudden the New York Times came knocking on the door and said, "You know what? Your coworker has been stealing all this money from another coworker." I think we, I think the bosses might get involved there. I think they might want to say, "Hey, we want to hear." Straight from like the horse's mouth, if you will. So anyway, that was just one of the other TikTok things that I thought uh, I took away from this. Like, where was the team? Where was his representatives? Imagine how much money Shohei Otani is paying CAA in fees, right? In, but in I, it's weird to, fees. Where are they? It feels weird to me to blame the Dodgers. I mean, who cares about CAA? But to blame the Dodgers, like the Dodgers are a hundred percent a victim in this. I mean, they got screwed over by somebody here, either Shohei or the interpreter. Oh, that that could totally be true. But also, they seem so 10 steps behind, or 10's too many, at least three steps behind. Like, but they just, they clearly didn't understand what was going on. And the reason why it's important, I think, that part of it, we're talking about Shohei Otani, that part of it, I think, is important is because there was one story that got out first because Ipe got to the media first, which was Shohei covered my gambling debts. Then the story yeah. changed so dramatically that no, but no, uh, I disavow that story. And actually, you know, I Shohei Otani is the victim of this massive fraud and theft. The story changed so dramatically, it makes Otani look bad. And that's why this mm. is such a big deal. That part of it is such a big deal. If you're the Dodgers, you got to wrap your arms around this thing a little bit more, go straight to Otani himself, as opposed to letting someone continue to speak for him literally. Yeah. And it makes it's making him look terrible. But I know I think he he ended all that by looking to a mic yesterday and said, I never bet on sports. So, I mean, maybe he's lying. If he's lying, that's one thing. But I think all whatever happened last week is ancient news because he basically said, I never did any of this. And now it's up to anyone, maybe a reporter or the feds or somebody uh, with authority to prove him wrong. See, I, I think all that. All that confusion last week, what none of it matters anymore because he came around and said, I never bet on sports. None right. of this happened. So either he's lying or he's not. Do you believe I I and I'm I feel like I'm an idiot, but I believe him. You can you can believe him. I mean, that's that's not wrong. You can believe him. But the thing is, is you you're saying that's all we have left to know about the story. Right. I, like, I don't none think of that that's stuff true. from none of that stuff from last week really matters. Unless you know about how did Ipe get access to the bank account? Yeah, yeah. Did Shohei actually know it was going to the bookie? I guess that would mean he was lying yesterday. So, but how did he get access to the bank accounts? I think is the yes. number one thing. Yeah, and did Shohei ever bet on sports anywhere? See, I, right. I think like. Shohei can't be that careful. If he was really out there betting on sports, he said, I never bet on anything. Right. Ever. Any sport. So if that's not true, if he actually is a better, don't you think somebody could prove that? And 855-212-4CBS, 855-212-4227. Also, and again, I don't want to be somebody, I don't want to be this person. I'm just saying I noticed this yesterday. New translator was a little nervous. Real nervous. And I imagine it is probably a difficult job, but to be honest, and this is where I'll go to the Dodgers, we need UN level translators now. You know, I this guy might be great. I don't know why they didn't give him a copy of the document that Shohei was reading off of so he could at least follow along and make notes. Instead, the guy's like writing it all freehand. It's a big deal. You know, you got your 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 star player. In some ways, the one thing I felt bad about Otani, if he really is totally innocent, he's got to feel like he's in a fever dream right now. He's all the way across the, the world from his home talking and trying to implore people to believe him. And it's like the dude next to him, It's all he's all at the mercy of the guy sitting next to him and what he says to the media. Like, can we can we get a UN level interpreter for Otani right now? Is that too much to ask? I don't know. This guy seemed fine to me. You didn't think he seemed nervous? 
Well, maybe, but it seemed like he translated him pretty faithfully. How do we know? I have no clue. Well, He's I writing mean, it all down freehand. Okay, how do we know? If, if the guy was, <laughs> there are enough people out there who were following that press conference. I think it would have come out if the interpreter was freelancing. Well, I'm just saying. <laughs> I think enough people who spoke Japanese and English could have watched that. See, this I don't is think a- the interpreter had wiggle room <laughs> to uh, really define his own story here. Okay, but I, I mean, do we know that Ipe was telling the, you know, I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, Ipe could have been lying for years. This is at the crux of this whole thing. I want somebody who's like translating between like heads of state. I, that guy seemed f- fine to me. I, I don't know. I was actually surprised. One thing I kind of believed. I'm. I can't. I feel like an idiot. The way Shohei was talking, he seemed kind of genuine to me. I don't understand Japanese, right. but it didn't and seem the body like language, it guess. didn't seem like he was searching for words. He was less like I didn't do this. You know, he seemed. Uh, I watch a lot of Law and Order. I probably would have believed this witness. <laughs> <laughs> but you just spend a month on the, jury duty. Yeah, there was no ambiguity in anything. He wasn't. Yeah, he true. wasn't looking for words. He's like, I did not do this. Leave me alone. In Japanese. Yeah. 855-212-4CBS. 855-212-4227. All right. So you got Otani. Put himself out there. Do you think this is going to backfire? And do you have any questions left? I think we pretty much hit everything that he said in those 12 minutes. I'll give him credit, a lot of credit for this, which is if he is telling the truth and this all got translated correctly, guy came right out about it. This will no longer be an issue for his teammates. I think he did the right thing by them and by the clubhouse. Um, and he, he was forceful. The only thing he didn't answer is how did he pay have access to his bank accounts? Well, maybe we'll get that answer. 855-212-4CBS. Lots to do, including a scare last night for Iowa. It came down to the wire for Caitlin Clark. Was she the hero though? Get to that in a moment. Maggie Perloff. You're in a five minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining.
two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Welcome back to Maggie and Perloff. Uh, quick update on my viral tweet the other day. It's, oh, yeah, it's up in the 18 millions or something. Uh, now I've become the anti Caitlin Clark person on Twitter. Because last night when she was stat padding at the end of the game with the free throws, I pointed it out. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but I got to tell you, America's with me because the officials sim- single handedly handed that game to Iowa last night. There was, what, nine calls? They favored Iowa in the last three minutes. The home crowd got to them. I'm just saying, and the funny thing, Maggie, you know I love Caitlin Clark. I know. But I am. I seem to be being positioned as someone said, uh, Stu Mandel, a friend said, is this Skip Bayless and LeBron James? Are you going after Caitlin? <laughs> there is a backlash against Caitlin. I'm seeing it big time. Wow. She complains about calls. Well, definitely. And, and she's a little cocky. So it's a little, it reminds me of Steph Curry a little bit. Like, we all love Steph Curry, but he could be a little petty. And Caitlin, Caitlin seems to be going there. The thing is, we need Iowa to keep winning, Meg. And I was nervous last night. Yeah, definitely nervous. West Virginia was not messing around. They were physical. They were getting second chance yeah. opportunities. They were turning Iowa yeah. over. I mean, this was Caitlin Clark's last game, though, in that building. Yeah. I mean, pretty special. But, man, was... I, don't, I can't say they deserve to lose. They didn't deserve to lose Iowa. I don't think the re- officials handed it to no, them no. like that. But... It's nervous time. And if you look at South Carolina and how they're blazing through their first games and you look yeah. at Iowa, it does not look the same. I mean, Iowa's struggled here. I had a thought when you go up against Iowa and all this media attention, you bring your A game. It's kind of like playing the Dallas Cowboys. They have a target on them. Not that anyone wouldn't play their A game in the NCAA tournament, but you feel, I noticed Holy Cross was playing out of their mind the first quarter. I think you get up for this game, and I think that's part of the issue with Iowa is, I mean, they're seeing, obviously you're going to see everyone's best game in the tournament, but I thought West Virginia looked really hyped for that game, and I mean, and Caitlin Clark's not shooting well either. No, she's not. Because they're, they're covering her. 50 feet from the basket, she's getting face guarded, so it's been frustrating. Yeah, no, there's definitely the book is out now about Caitlin, and it's not like she's not scoring at all, but these are not yeah. the looks that we were seeing that really catapulted yeah. her to superstar. Yeah. No way. Yeah, she had over 30 points last night. It's yeah, not like right. she's doing nothing, but it's she's not efficient. Though. You're right. She's yeah. getting tough shots. It's, it's hard for her to get good looks right now because yeah. the defenses are focusing on her. 
man, we're, but I got to say, I'm not anti Caitlin Clark. I just say that. I love Caitlin Clark, love Iowa, want to see them advance and lose to South Carolina. Oh boy, Pearl Luff, that's going to get you in trouble. Andrew Bogus is here with headlines. Good morning, Bogus. Good morning, guys. Those headlines sponsored by Progressive Insurance. Drivers who switch and save with Progressive save nearly $750 on average. So call or click today and find out if we could save you hundreds on your car insurance. The other second round game in the Albany 2 region last night, tight as well, second seeded UCLA surviving number seven, Creighton 67-63. The Bruins were down 10 in the third quarter. They'll face LSU this weekend in Albany. That winner gets the winner of Iowa, Colorado for a final four spot. USC, meanwhile, the one seed in Portland three had an easier evening. Watkins right in the middle of the lane can rise up and knock it down. Padilla found her with a long pass. Juju flashed right to the middle of the key. Turnaround shot is good. And Juju has 21 to go along with eight rebounds. That's from 790 KABC. Stud freshman Juju Watkins, 28 points, 11 rebounds, five assists in the 73-55 decision over Kansas. The Trojans now face Baylor in Portland on Saturday. Uh, whatever the swivel hip drop tackle is, it is now <laughs> banned in the NFL. Owners passing that rule change reportedly unanimously yesterday at the league's annual meetings in Orlando. NFL Executive VP Troy Vincent has said he expects more fines after the fact, not actual penalty flags for this. Defensive players, as you might guess, are not fans of this decision. Wait, he said more fines than penalty flags? He thinks it's going to be like the rules... Uh, with using your head mm-hmm. on tackles, that it's going people are going to get in trouble for after the fact. It's not going to be called live in the moment. I would love, love to take a bet with him on that. I know we're talking about betting a lot. Yeah, I mean, he. I, I think he does have some empirical data that in the last two years, I think when the rule has been different, players are getting those silly fine letters. They're not getting yeah. called for putting their head down and drilling guys. Oh, every Monday games. we have a headline. Oh, there was no flag. Uh, thrown, but he did get a fine. That happens every week. Oh, I get it. And we're going to talk more about the hip drop tap later, but this is how they do this. And we should all remember this in the beginning of the season next year when we're thinking about making bets on games or whatever. They're going to call this like crazy in the beginning of the season. Mm. I think they're going to do that and they're going to set a precedent like this is what it is, this is what it is. It's going to be a quote-unquote point of emphasis. And then they'll phase it out a little bit towards them because believe me, it's going to be a controversial call that's going to swing a game. We can book it right now, and then they'll sort of fade it out, and then they'll start giving the like fines. Like crazy. How, how much do you expect? Two a game? Uh, no, see, I think you're overestimating <laughs> how often these type of plays happen. Okay, it's not like pass interference or holding where it's going to be there, and they're like, we're calling this. It needs to happen for it to be called, which is why I think it leads to this idea of it's going to be more about fines. Okay, but they're, how, not, they're not doing this in every tackle in a game. Sure, I get that, but let's just say, would you say there's probably one horse collar tackle per game? I, I don't think I don't so. think per game. I don't know no. one per game, but maybe at half. Or maybe one that could one every, have been called. One every couple games. Uh, I, I, I think I, those are obvious. I, I think this you is can, like a horse. Yeah. Is a little, it's like being compared to the horse collar tackle. It's much harder to see, though, than the horse collar tackle. Because a horse collar tackle, obviously, right. you get your hand up in the yeah, neck. This is more frequent than a horse collar tackle. Well, I'm just saying it's being compared it? to that. I think there's one think horse collar tackle a game. If you sat there and watch every game on Sunday or one that should have been called that doesn't get called. Anyway. There are a lot of horse collars, though, that end up being like we think they're horse collars, but then we realize the guy grabbed the jersey. Yeah, yeah. Something and then there's like that. somewhere like we don't think it's a horse collar, but then we look at it and replay, oh, actually it was. So maybe that's kind of like screwing up my head in terms of how many there are. I just feel like this thing that they were showing yesterday, I see all the time. Yeah, right. that, like it's not something like this is this is gonna happen. I I agree with your point that this is gonna happen a lot. How they call it is gonna be interesting, but uh, we'll talk about it later. But I, I'm not too thrilled about it. Yeah, same. Well, also we're doing the one hit wonder bracket still. Isn't um swivel hip drop one of the songs from the '70s <laughs> that got on here? Funky Town and the swivel hip drop. It's a dance move that we're all very familiar with. <laughs> it's an eleven seed. Uh, Niners GM John Lynch said yesterday, why that Brandon Ayuk is not on the trade block. Instead, they are working on an extension with him as he enters the final year of his rookie deal. And great news for Pete and his Jet fan friends. You know, if we don't trade him, we're, we're going to keep him. So it's possible that he could, that he could do it here. He won't there was it a- probably better from, a, from his standpoint, it's probably better if he changes faces and gets to a new place. 
So that's owner Woody Johnson. The first sentence is the key. If we can't trade him, we'll keep him. He's talking about Zach Wilson. So your days with Zach hanging well, out in the QB room, maybe not done just well, yet. Well, what do you want him to say? Oh, he's a bum. We're not going to do, uh, we're going to try to get rid of him as fast as we can. Uh, he's not going to say that. Well, he, he can't, he can't say that. <laughs> but he can't, he can't say what he said, though. Right. That, that was the definition of hustling backwards. The definition. Because nobody in their right mind thinks that Zach Wilson has any value. So putting out there this like almost like empty threat that, oh, if you guys don't want to, we'll just keep him. Yeah, right. He's an asset. It's yeah. like, who is that scaring? Yeah, right. What team is like, so oh, no, him. we can't trade for Zach Wilson. We better ante up a real draft pick or else we're going to lose out on this prize prospect. What What is he talking about? I got to be honest, too. So you got Aaron Rodgers coming off an Achilles at 40. You got Tyrod Taylor, who has also been injured in his late 30s at this point. If Zach Wilson's on that roster, I bet Zach Wilson starts a game. Uh, that, Guys, I'm just saying. Can't. I know he's you're not right, gonna, and that's why this can't happen. It can't happen. It's happening, he's baby. Not gonna, <laughs> he, he's not going to be there. If, 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 if he is there at the start of training camp, then I'll yell and scream and, and complain, and I'll probably do it every day. So I think this is more of a strategy thing than anything else. Wait, are you pacing yourself right now? Well, you have to with this because I, I, I've yelled enough at it in, in a regular season. I mean, I mean, give me a break. <laughs> so, Pete's so, tired. All right, tired he's it. fed up. Look, the, look, the, it's pretty obvious that he's QB number three in the room. So uh, let them do their work and see what happens. If, if you get to after the draft and he's still there, then yell and complain. That's the, the other issue too. Is that I want them to draft a quarterback. So like, is Zach still around? What is is the rookie that's the third or fourth round pick going to be a QB four? What's going on? He's EJ, not going to be EJ, there. They didn't bring in a viable veteran last year because they're worried about Aaron Rodgers. You think they're drafting a quarterback? No shot. But we can argue about that yeah. another time. Anything else, folks? No, I'm just stunned by Pete reaching the end of emotions. I didn't think that was possible. <laughs> he could be tapped down no, on a topic. It's, it's, it's like a dead end. He's got to turn in the around and roll back. This feels it's historical. In this is an intermission. <laughs> Usually you're ahead of the game with the anger. Here you go. I'm good for now. I'll oh, check is, back with you in September. This is an intermission. You need intermissions during uh, jet anger. So, so <laughs> during this, this is drama? an intermission. Yes. Wow, yeah. Pete historians marking this date down. There you go. How about Pete's new book? Uh I'll get back to I'll you. Get, no, it's like uh, taking a break. <laughs> intermission. Yeah, an intermission sabbatical. from my anger. Taking a sabbatical <laughs> from it. It's a, like a, what about Bob? Taking a vacation from my feelings. Right? Sail. I sail. I'm a sailor. I'm a sailor. 855. Thank you, Bogus. 212-4CBS. 855-212-4227. Sorry, taking a vacation from my problems. Uh, coming up, David Sampson is a former president of the Miami Marlins um, and has – had Japanese players who had interpreters playing for his team. He weighs in on everything we heard from Shohei Otani yesterday. We'll do that next. It's Maggie and Perloff, CBS Sports Radio. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three 
three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Perloff. We love early risers around here <laughs> because that's our life now. David Sampson is the former president of the Miami Marlins, now the host of Nothing Personal, fantastic podcast about to go out on a live tour, Nothing Personal Live, and he joins us already in a suit. David, thank you so much for getting up for us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I didn't get up for you. Oh. I am up every day at this time. This is what successful people do. They wake up early. They get things done early in the day. So, David, you know, we wanted to tap into your expertise here as a former baseball president who has dealt with players who needed translators. And obviously the Shohei Otani story takes this to an entirely new level. I saw you tweeted yesterday that you thought this press conference achieved, accomplished absolutely nothing, in your opinion. You know, people like Perloff thought Otani came off really well, came off mm. genuine. Why did you say and why do you think it accomplished nothing? Well, first of all, I have no understanding how any advisor would have allowed him to say anything publicly, mm. given that they're pending investigations. But if I can get past that absolute bad advice. Let's talk about what he said. He simply put a face to what had been leaked out and the story that had been told ever since the interpreter started with the story that Otani was involved, recanted it, got disavowed, and then they've stuck with this current story ever since. So all he did was reiterate what we've already known, but he didn't take questions. He didn't allow cameras. So I really don't want anyone to call it a press conference. It was merely a well-attended statement reading. 
But David, couldn't you argue that at least Shohei put himself out there? Now, if he's lying, he's sort of uh, giving himself uh, the rope to hang himself. Now we know he's. This is his story. Now it's up to re- investigators or reporters to prove it wrong. So it seems a little more black and white to me. Well, when you've got a story that you want to stick to, I appreciate that you think that that's your story and you should always stick to it. And we tell people all the time, okay, if you want to say that, but the problem is it's not just MLB investigating. You've got the IRS. There's an entire gambling ring that is being looked at and money disappeared. And the biggest question that we needed answered is, how does the interpreter have access to your bank account? I've worked with Japanese players. I've worked with Hispanic players. I've worked with white players and black players. You can hear anything you want about how players have so much money that they don't know where their money is and they rely on all of their friends and family to take care of their money. But four and a half million dollars missing from bank transfers. It's not like this is a cash business. You've got banks involved. You've got authentication requirements for ID. All of these steps that get taken when I wire $100, somehow these wires went through and he knew nothing about it. It's just shocking. I certainly do hope it's true, though. So, David, David Sampson joining us, the former president of the Marlins. So you think that even though you've probably witnessed players who have been stolen from either by family members or financial advisors, and you've seen this firsthand, you still think this is hard to believe that Shohei wouldn't have known anything? Well, when I say that I've seen all players, I can tell you I had players who didn't know whether they had deposited their paycheck before there was direct deposit. So I understand that some players may not know where their money is or know what the balance is in their checking account. But at the end of the day, when there's $500,000 wires coming out of your account, I'm not sure that anybody who's not a signatory on an account can do that. And my point is, Otani didn't address any of that. He merely stuck to his story. I didn't bet on baseball. I didn't bet on anything. And this man stole from me. And it's not like he stole cash from under the mattress. The matter in which he stole was in getting wire transfers to an illegal bookmaker. And in this day and age, banks are not just willy-nilly doing wire transfers. But all this is going to come out. He's put himself in a position where now he better be right about everything he said. So it's interesting, Otani's camp obviously let this quote-unquote press conference happen. What about the Dodgers' role in this? Uh, Can the Dodgers jump in and say, just stop talking? That's what I would have done. People ask me as president of the Marlins, I can tell you, I would not have done this with a Dodgers background, with their sponsors in the background of their uh, uh, press conference room. And I love that they showed support and they made it known that Stan Kasten was there and Andrew Friedman was there. And you had players, Joe Kelly was there and Kike Hernandez supporting him. And I get when we want to support our players and be a team. I've had press conferences like this, but there's certain times, especially for me when gambling is concerned, that I'm not rolling out the red carpet for this sort of announcement when I know MLB is investigating. On the other hand, he's the face of baseball. There is nobody in baseball who should be or wants to be protected or needs to be protected more than Shohei. So I'm not the only one who wishes that this whole story is true. The Dodgers, MLB, his teammates, the union, everybody hopes that what he said yesterday was true. David Sampson is joining us. He's the former president of the Marlins. He hosts a podcast called Nothing Personal. It's going out on the road. Nothing Personal Live. The live tour is going to be happening soon, and you can find information for that on David's Twitter handle, David P. Sampson. Okay, let's talk more about the Dodgers for a second, David, because I thought they ended up looking bad yesterday because Shohei gave us a little more of the TikTok of what happened in South Korea. So you've got ESPN and the LA Times are both now sniffing around a story that has to do with Shohei Otani and a betting ring in Southern California. Nobody went to Otani. All that Dodger brass was all in South Korea. You don't have an, anyone else. No one could approach Otani and tell him, hey, we've got two major news outlets that are coming and asking questions. They still let Ipe be the, the, the point person here. I mean, you were the president of a franchise. Do you think the Dodgers look bad or am I crazy? Oh, no, you're not crazy at all. You're brilliant. When I'm dealing with players, let's let's go to something as benign as arbitration. When we're making offers back and forth to younger players, we're dealing with the agent, but we always make sure the player knows what our offer is. 
When we're trying to sign a free agent, we talk to the agents, but we make sure the player knows that we're interested in what we're offering. We don't leave anything up to anybody. The Dodgers have this major problem coming while they're in Korea, and Otani's claiming he knew nothing about it till he got back to the hotel after the team meeting because Ipe was speaking only in English and he couldn't fully understand the scope. The timeline concerns me because the night before, ESPN had word from the interpreter that Otani was completely involved and then his story got recanted and he got totally disavowed by the Dodgers and MLB trying to be disappeared. We haven't heard a word from him. So I just find that difficult that the Dodgers would have sat back and said, all right, let's not talk to Shohei. We'll only deal with the interpreter. I've just never done that in my 18 years in the game. You know, not to make an excuse, but they were in Korea. There was a lot going on. The season's about to start. I, I was arguing with Maggie about this. I'll, I don't know that it was that easy for the Dodgers to understand the scope of what was happening. Is it possible that a lot fell through the cracks here? Boy, that have to be a Grand Canyon size crack. Mm -hmm. When you hear your best player and then you hear the word gambling and four and a half million dollars missing and the LA Times is coming out with a piece that they had been investigating and ESPN had a 90 minute interview with the translator that was set up by Otani's spokesman himself. I find it hard to believe that nobody knew anything. And in terms of how busy they were, I only say, give me a break and that I've been super busy running a team, but I always have time to deal with the crisis because certain things, when they come on your desk or in your ear, they go right to the top of the list. And this would have gone directly to the top of the list. David Sampson is joining us, the former president of the Marlins, the host of Nothing Personal. Um, what other questions do you still have, David, after after the press conference? Say you're the Dodgers, you know, and you're sitting in the room. Like, what's the next steps? What questions do you still have? And, uh, and and how would you like them to be answered, I guess? I'd love to know from MLB how long they think their investigation is going to last, how long the cloud will be over the franchise, because like with Trevor Bauer, and this happened with the Dodgers, they put Bauer on administrative leave, and that was the end of him. They took his jerseys out of the team store, and they just pretended he didn't exist. And then it went on and on and on, and it didn't matter. They kept pretending he didn't exist. Otani's batting second every single day. There are scores of Japanese reporters following him and the team every day. This is the type of story that you cannot get rid of. It continues to come up. So I'd want to know from MLB, what's your timing? MLB would like to get their investigation done today, but they simply can't. There's too much to figure out. David, just pulling back a little bit, we have an NBA possible betting scandal last night was reported. Uh, where are we in the state of uh, betting being connected to pro sports right now? And I'm associated and, and proudly with DraftKings, but I'll tell you right now, we're in a state of panic. And the reason we're in a state of panic is that anytime you have an issue with the integrity of the sport, whether it's with referees, whether it's with players or known associates of players, you're getting down to the core issue of associating with gambling companies that leagues had to get past in order to do business with them. And the core issue is we are not wrestling. This is not a scripted game. We don't know the outcome. We don't do anything to tell anyone what the outcome could be. There's no risk. And now more and more every day we hear things where players are concerned or they're involved, this NBA story, and I'm gonna discuss it today on Nothing Personal in greater detail, but just think about this. If he knows that people are betting the under on his prop bets, and he then makes sure that every one of those prop bets wins, and he benefits from that, either directly or indirectly, that's a major betting scandal. That's suspension, if not lifetime. So that story in the NBA is a very important story that we're just starting to understand. David Sampson joining us. David, only have about 45 seconds left. So just back to Shohei for a moment. So the translator now is going to be someone from the Dodgers, right? <laughs> so I, I, to like, I, my question is moving forward. Can Shohei say, I want somebody new. I want a UN level interpreter here. I need somebody who's like doing head of state type stuff so nothing like this ever happens again. 
Yeah, of course he can. When we signed Ichiro, he told us who his translator was, and we hired him, period. Didn't even do a background check. Didn't need to. It turns out Alan's an amazing guy who I would trust with anything. But Shohei has the right to tell the Dodgers, listen, I don't like this person. I'd like someone different. Because you do have to be friends with your translator. You're with them all the time. Yeah, see, that's why it also, I, Shohei said yesterday that he didn't know that Ipe was sports gambling. Never knew, yet the guys spend every waking moment together. Had no clue he was into sports betting. Uh, that seems a little crazy to me. David, we're flat out of time. David Sampson, you can listen to him. Nothing personal, the live tour. Nothing personal live gets going soon. Thank you, David. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, we got a lot more on this coming up, including Cowboys news. Jerry pulling a 180. What did he have to say about the Cowboys offseason? Get to that next. Thank you, Prolo. You're in a five minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One
One minute remaining. Forty-five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. He's been on the TB12 method since he was six. She's on her third scotch. They are Maggie and Perloff on CBS Sports Radio. All right, it's lying season, Perloff, and I don't believe a word of what's coming out of the owners' meetings. Welcome to the show, Maggie Gray, Andrew Perloff. The idea that because Jim Harbaugh mm-hmm. is caping so hard for his former quarterback, J.J. McCarthy, that that is actually moving the needle, I don't believe any of this. I, I I don't either. I think the needle had already moved on its own. This has nothing to do with Harbaugh. Okay, well, first let's get you up to speed. So yeah. The owners' meeting's happening in Orlando. Jim Harbaugh clearly trying to set up his guy, J.J. McCarthy. He said he's the best quarterback in the history of Michigan football. Already said that. Now he said McCarthy had the best pro day he's ever seen. That was the best I've ever seen a uh, a quarterback do at a pro day. I mean, not only was his feet great in the individual drills, and um, and but then he started throwing, and it was like every every throw was you know right there. I thought our receivers did a great job too. Uh, they all had a great day, but that was the best throwing day I've ever seen. Okay, there's nothing that's like only medium for Jim Harbaugh. Everything's the best ever, right? Yeah, who's so, got it better than us at Pro Days? Yeah, yeah nobody. Uh, so that coupled with a report from Tom Pelissero from the NFL Network, and he said, when I've had conversations with executives from other teams who know Adam Peters, the new general manager of the Washington Commanders, who are picking second overall, who know the situation, the most popular answer for what they do at number two is J.J. McCarthy. I cannot believe that these executives are all telling the truth on this. I think there are agendas. I think agendas are agendaing, as EJ would say. I don't believe that everyone is just arriving at this. I, I find this very, very difficult to believe, and I will not forget it is lying season. I'm just a blatant skeptic on this. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. I'm coming around on J.J. McCarthy. I I do think the NFL really liked First of all, it's nothing to do with Harbaugh's comment. Probably has nothing to do with the pro day either. Uh, the pro days, we have a bunch of pro days this week. They're somewhat meaningless. Any quarterback can throw in shorts. I, I think the NFL has been high on J.J. McCarthy for a while. Here's the thing. All year long and all draft season long, it's been one, two, three. Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May. Or Caleb Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels as the top three quarterbacks, the top three picks. Yep. What on earth has the draft intelligentsia known what the top three picks are? It never, ever ever happens that way. So basically the media takes a lot of guesses in January and February. The teams haven't even set their boards by then. I think that it's more likely that the media has been wrong this whole time and that it's a different order. And I don't think people care in the NFL about his stats in college because we have a lot of evidence that stats in college do not translate to the NFL and teams don't necessarily care. I mean, Jordan Love had a terrible last year. Josh Allen had a terrible last year. You go through a lot of first rounders did not produce in their last season, and it's totally fine. The NFL does not seem to care that much. Okay, well, Will Levis didn't have a good final season, and he did slip to the second round. So there's both sides of this thing. Now, I should mention that J.J. McCarthy's odds to be selected um, with a second overall pick have now jumped, like, dramatically because of this. Okay, so here's the question, though. 
even if it, the counting stats are not there with McCarthy, right? right? Because that's the thing. The counting stats aren't going to be there because Michigan did not have a passing attack. So what are what are you looking at or what do you think they are looking at where they're saying, oh, I've got all of this, you know, uh, evidence that he is going to be this great NFL quarterback? Well, I mean, a couple of things we know about J.J. McCarthy. He's athletic. Uh, he clearly has a big arm. He's got plenty of size. I mean, I guess, what is he, 6'2", but there's no issue there. He's more accurate than Drake May. Drake May was all over the place this year. Right. We saw Drake May throw in the dirt way too many times. He's thicker than Jaden Daniels, so that's a downside. He's not Caleb Williams, but the only downside on him, I mean, he was a gigantic recruit. They, what can't, can't he do? He just d- can't throw 40 times a game in Michigan. But <laughs> right? I think people are like, oh, well, that's Michigan. Okay, so but, it's a situational thing. Okay, I get that. But again, like if you aren't giving that many opportunities yeah. to throw, then I get you're efficient when you do throw the mm-hmm. football, and he was good when he did throw. But if I did ask him to throw 40 times, what do you think it would look oh, like? Oh, I mean, I think he would have big numbers. I think, I mean, he would but have. But would there be more warts too? Like you're talking about Drake May. Yeah. If, we, if, if it was really this more passing attack, wouldn't there be more opportunities for mistakes to happen and things like that? It's 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 hard to just say because he was efficient in a small yeah. sample size that he, if you had expanded out, he would have the same numbers. Uh, yeah, let's compare him to Will Levis, for example. Will Levis, uh, last two years, 24 touchdowns, 13 picks uh, in his junior year, then 19 touchdowns, 10 picks his senior year. J.J. McCarthy, 22 and 5 his uh, sophomore year and 22 and 4 last year. Or actually, I guess I, I can't remember. He... Is he a red shirt? Anyway, he has very, very efficient numbers. So there's reason to believe if he had thrown more, he still would have completed 70% of his passes, didn't throw a lot of picks, much cleaner than, uh, I think he's actually cleaner than Drake May. I, why would, if you project it forward, why wouldn't he have good numbers? I'm not sure where these warts would come from. Well, I'm just saying if you, I said Will Levis slipped because you're talking about people who had bad years uh, and they still were able to be drafted high. And I said, Will Levis didn't have a good year and he wasn't drafted high. They thought he was going to be a first round pick and everyone was wrong about that. And he sat in the green room and was embarrassed. And I wouldn't want that same fate to happen to J.J. McCarthy. And let's be honest. I mean, the team that J.J. McCarthy had around him at Michigan, not just the running attack, which Will Levis didn't have that his his last year, the offensive line where you have one of his tackles is probably going to be a top 10 pick, maybe a definitely first round. And you had the best defense in college football. I mean, yeah. it didn't – I don't want to say things were easy for J.J. McCarthy, and I don't think he should be necessarily docked for that. But this dude was on an amazing team. Two, both, a, both but years. I don't think it's an amazing passing team. I mean, listen, he had a he had a run first coach. I mean, if you want an amazing passing offense, look over on the next door to Ohio State. Like, yeah, it's not like no, Ryan he, Day and all these receivers were. He did not have this. He was not set up to throw forty touchdowns because it's not their style. Also, they didn't really have that kind of personnel. No, no. no. What I'm saying is, yeah. he benefited from the fact that there were games where Michigan's opponent couldn't get past the four. They're right, right, forty. Right. That's <laughs> why they won. But that doesn't mean that he wasn't a good quarterback when he was on the field. I'm just saying, like, he was not. He didn't have all these great receivers around him. Remember, we were dating C.J. Stroud in the draft. Who are like, oh my God, I could go out there and throw to those guys. J.J. McCarthy wasn't in that situation. It wasn't easy. It wasn't set up for passing success. It was set up to win a lot of football games. Sure. Absolutely. I agree with you. That was the defense. That was the run game. I mean, talk about the run game. You yeah, had to amazing. stack the box against Michigan. So uh, I, those are all negatives. But I, I think it's an imperfect draft after Caleb Williams. He's perfect. But after that... You're guessing. I, I can see why J.J. McCarthy's right in the mix with Jaden Daniels and Drake May. Now, in my opinion, Jaden Daniels should be the number two. It should be no doubt about it. Yeah, you and then I you have a big, big together. McCarthy. I can see a McCarthy May debate. So this is though directly linking the Washington Commanders. This yeah. report directly linking the Washington Commanders, who picked second overall. Right. So unless you think they're trading out of that pick, which would be a dicey proposition, but if they think that somebody else wants to, you know, jump up for Jaden Daniels. Maybe you could do that kind of thing. I don't know if the Washington Commanders would get that cute if this report is true. And again, I don't believe it. I we always forget it's lying season. Well, we don't forget, but yeah. you want to believe these fun things. And I just I I see your point that maybe everyone was wrong about the first three quarterbacks. Right? Why would you believe top. that? Well, the reason why I believe that. Actually, I don't know if I believe that. But I mean, there's a report. Daniel Jeremiah had a report that one GM told him that Adam Peters, the GM, loves 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 Drake May. 
everybody That's else on saying. earth is as linked. Jaden, da- every mock draft has Jaden Daniels at number two. Why, why not believe the J.J. McCarthy thing? It could be one of a series of lies, but the other ones might be lies too. Yeah, I, I guess maybe I'm, I just staunchly don't believe any of it. I think what you and I and where the conversation is best served is do you think that J.J. McCarthy is worthy of the second overall pick? Whatever that means. I know Zach Wilson was a second overall pick. Our pal Ryan was a second overall pick. There's a lot of times it, you can be a second overall pick and it can go, it can go sideways. But does he deserve to be, all things be equal, yeah. Does he deserve to be drafted higher than Jaden Daniels? Uh, I'm not sure. What do you mean deserve? Well, I guess um, if you if you were making a quarterback in a lab or you I've, needed a quarterback for no, your for your franchise. Deserve is the wrong word. Yeah, deserve is the wrong deserve. word. Uh, Who, who's going to be a better NFL quarterback? Yeah. I prefer Jaden Daniels myself because I saw it and the guy is dominant in every possible way. He's, he runs like Lamar Jackson and throws like, uh, I mean, his arm is amazing. So, and he's done, done everything you could possibly do. I think Jaden Daniels is going to be a star. I think there's concern that about durability, sure. which I understand. Um, but for McCarthy, the teams see something different. They see potential. And they like untapped potential, and that's how coaches are. So they probably see, well, you know what? He never threw the ball in the second half against Penn State. But they think, ooh, if I could get this guy with those tools into my building – that's that's what this game is. Coaches think that they can coach up guys who have the physical tools. J.J. McCarthy obviously has that. I mean, you watch him. Yeah. No one said, oh, the guy can't throw. There's not a pass he can't throw. So I think the, the question is a lack of production, and NFL teams always look past that. They don't really care what you did at college. We're talking about it. There's a Penn State alum in the, uh, in the bullpen over here. Penn State defensive ends never get a single sack. Chop Robinson did nothing in college, and yet he's going to be a first-rounder because he can run a 4-5-40 the coaches love physical potential, and that's what this is. They don't care about college production. Will you agree with that part? Uh, I think it's probably split, actually. I think I think that's why you see guys like, uh, you know, like Lamar Jackson fall to the end of the first round. I think that some people right. like, you know, what they saw, like a Kyler Murray and Baker Mayfield and the stats and right. the big-time numbers, and I think some are willing to go for guys who – Maybe are a little bit more raw. I, I hear you. Or but whatever. Not that Lamar was raw. I'm thinking more like that Josh Allen was raw. The but. name that jumps to my mind, Kenny Pickett. I mean, he could not have had better stats. He had 42 touchdowns and seven picks his senior year. Right, so we know what the Steelers lie on. That. Right. I just think that it's it's very easy to get fooled by this gigantic production in college. Um, that being said, I just said I love Jaden Daniels. Uh, you're right. There's no steadfast rule. But there are guys who do not produce, who jump up. And we're like, how did that happen? Because the coaches see the potential. 855-212-4CBS, 855-212-4227. So uh, you're welcome to weigh in on J.J. McCarthy. Do you think he'll be the best pro out of this class, the second best? Maybe well, is Caleb a little in a in a category all his own? Well, that I don't think that's a debate. <laughs> the okay. debate is, will he go number two? Is that Because that seems crazy. Do you, I think if you're going to put a poll question up, BJ, do you think J.J. McCarthy will go number two in the draft? And I, I imagine 95% will say no. I think so, just but, because but then we again, watched we, him. <laughs> but we just heard Tom Palacero had a poll at the owner's meeting when those guys are probably closer to the situation, and it seems like 70% of them say yes. So it is, it's an interesting uh, dichotomy here. What's really going on? Can I also just uh, say something? I'm going to plant my flag here a little bit, which is, I don't know about this class. Of what? Out, out, of quarterbacks. Oh. Outside of Caleb. And this is, really? you and I are going to disagree about this because, first of all, like many years, you have a lot of these guys, if it does go quarterbacks, one, two, three, four, let's say, or even just say it's one, two, three. Not everyone's stepping into a great situation. That's always true. It's it's hard to change your fortunes right away when you're getting... Obviously, if you're taking this high in the draft, and picking this high, your team stinks, you know? So I think a lot of guys are walking into situations that are really unsettled. Washington Commanders, new ownership group, couldn't be worse than the last group. Ooh, I kind of like everything the Commanders are doing, but go ahead. Okay, but again, you've got, you know, Dan Quinn and Cliff Kingsbury. That's pretty good. Okay. We'll Dan see. Quinn, I mean, at least he's an experienced guy. No, I like Quinn. I'm just saying... Uh, that feels like an actually uh, strangely solid choice by the commanders. It could be. I, I was wondering why Dan Quinn was getting passed over for some of these jobs that he was allegedly linked to after the Cowboys defense was awesome year yeah. after year after year. Anyway... Uh, new ownership group, so there's just a little bit there that is a wild card and all that. Then you're talking about the New England Patriots, so you move on from Brady, it doesn't look great. Now you're moving on from Belichick, 
that there's just a lot of uncertainty in that organization right now. I think the stability of the Patriots, that is something of the past now. Now they're just like every other team who's going to make mistakes and who may take a minute to settle on some of these new positions in terms of the front office and coaching staff. So, and then who knows what what four is going to be. Yeah, well, three is a disaster. There's no doubt about that. The Patriots, you do not want to go there. And maybe they won't take a quarterback for that very reason. But Washington has Terry McLaurin, they have Jahan Dotson, they just signed Austin Eckler. If it was that easy, why haven't they had any success? Because I'm telling you, Adam Peters is going to be a great GM, I think. I mean, no one's gotten more buzz over the league than their new GM, Adam Peters, comes from San Francisco. Everyone thinks he's going to be solid. They, the commanders, I think, raised their floor because they signed a lot of veterans. They got Frankie Louvu, who everybody wanted, Jeremy Chin, Bobby Wagner. They brought in a lot of veterans on defense. So they're sure. paying up on defense to be, at least be respectable. So that gives them bottom line. But, I mean, that's not a bad set of weapons. It's not the worst offensive line. I think commanders could work. I don't think New England could work at all. They have nobody. Well, and then if we just backtrack it up to the number one overall pick, it's a Chicago Bears team that, you know, has weapons, has come along nicely, but I don't think you and I both don't believe in Eber Flus, the head coach, and the Bears yeah. have had a 100-year history of not being able to develop quarterbacks. Yeah, the counter-argument is this is the best situation a number one has ever had because they they weren't supposed to be number one. They were 7-10 and 10 last year, so at least Caleb joins a near 500 team. It's not the wor- That is definitely not the worst situation we've ever seen for number one. He's not Kyler Murray going to the Cardinals. You know, you're right. Maybe I'm being glass half full here. I think this class could be awesome because I think Michael Penix is going to be a star. Well, and he's going to be going the, though. I, unless he goes, you can't say Raiders, it doesn't matter. It yeah, definitely matters. you're right. It does. Uh, the Raiders scares me, but whoever hooks up with Sean Payton has a good chance to put up numbers. I think this is going to be a great class, and I think next year's class, everything you hear is not going to be a great year. I think this is. This is it. If you need a quarterback, take it out. You don't like you don't like Penix and Knicks and and uh, Drake May. Drake May's gonna be good too. Watch the highlights of that dude. I was just criticizing him earlier, but he's big and mobile and has a gun. This is gonna be a great class. I'm getting a little nervous. Some of the guys, the the X's, the Knicks and the Penix. Anthony Richardson threw 14 touchdowns no, in no, his no. entire career, it's and he was the number four. I mean, these guys are definitely way farther along than he was. Okay, but Richardson had what you were talking about earlier, which was what. Potential. Potential, yes. Right, okay. Knicks and Penix are guys who are in college for six years, yeah. right? We saw, yeah. like, did they get better because they got better? Or no, did they get Michael be- Penix at Indiana was amazing. Well, but kept getting hurt, right? Right, right. But I think medical science is going to help Penix. I think he's going to get past that. <laughs> the bionic man. Uh, I hope so because I love watching a play. But did they get better because they were getting better? Or like for Knicks, for example, did he get better just because all of a sudden he found himself being more experienced and older than other people in college? Like when you're 25, play, or how old's Penix? No, 23? You're 23, you're still playing against 19-year-olds and 20-year-olds. You just have institutional yeah. knowledge and your age helps you in a way that's not going to help you in the NFL. Yeah, but I mean, fair. But those guys have pretty big arms. I mean, you can't ignore that. I, just watch them. They, yeah. Nobody throws them a prettier deep ball than Michael Penix. And Penix, again, he was amazing at Indiana. I just think nobody thought he could stay healthy. Two knee surgeries on and both knees. Yeah, I, I think that the arthritic knee is a concern. And that if he does fall, uh, I, I'll bet you it's going to be a 50% hit rate. I'll bet you we get at least three pro bowlers out of this class, which is a gigantic quarterback class. Usually, look at the Zach Wilson draft. I mean, it was not looking great. Trevor, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, Justin Fields, Mac Jones. We would have thought that was a good class. Did you uh, you know, I I think everyone was into that class. This class is going to be way better than that. It can't be worse, Maggie. How can it be worse than the Zach Wilson class? 855-212-4CBS. <laughs> 855-212-4227. So, J.J. McCarthy, do you think he's going to go number two overall to the Commanders? That is the new... It's not even a rumor. It's like a informed yeah, the, rumor. You know, you, there's odds on all this, and it's jumping. As you, I think you mentioned yep. the J.J. McCarthy odds have jumped big time. All right, coming up, uh, your phone calls, of course. Again, 855-212-4CBS. We say good morning to our CBS Sports Radio affiliates. Thank you for being with us. You can find us on the absolutely free to download Odyssey app. It's crystal clear. It's awesome. You can hit rewind. You can, it's just so functional. We're on Sirius XM channel 158. And if you'd like to watch the show, because hot damn, we are good looking. YouTube.com slash CBS Sports Radio. Twitch.tv slash CBS Sports Radio. Coming up, we update our bracket of one hit wonders. March Madness, Maggie and Perloff style next. You're in a five minute break.
Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Welcome back to Maggie and Perloff. Now, I know you, you and Pete Pilati have a close relationship on 80s movies. Yeah, we do. 
But me and Pipilotti, I think, are more music twins because all weekend long we played 80s one hit wonders <laughs> in my house. And my wife's really into our one hit wonders bracket. Most of all the good one hit wonders come from the 80s because I think these days, if you have one hit, you're likely to have more or something. I don't know. They just don't do the, the bangers from the early 80s. Oh, I thought it was cocaine. I don't know what it was. It <laughs> you just... get famous, you get rich off a of one-hit wonder, and all of a sudden, oh. the lifestyle. Although, Rick James had many hits, so I guess that's not Did a one-size-fits-all. Rick James had many hits. Oh, absolutely. He had Mary Jane. He had Super Freak. He had Super Freak. And Mary Jane. <laughs> okay. It's, it's not like... <laughs> what you know about Mary? Beatles. Mary Jane. Well, yeah, the White Album. It was meant a different thing. I don't know. Uh, you know, I was also wondering, Cool and the Gang, really, we know for Celebration. I know they were a giant band. Jungle Boogie. Okay, I know, but... I just think that you guys put Simple Minds on there for Don't You Forget About Me, and they have a ton of hits. Yeah, but you said in the UK. We didn't no, even they, know about them. They had five top ten singles in the U.S. Why didn't you mention this when I the bracket don't. came out? Well, I did. No, I told you, don't forget about Alive and Kicking, and you are like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is the March Madness, uh, Maggie and Perloff style. We're doing a bracket of one-hit wonders. I'm glad that your wife is enjoying this so much. I hope she's voting. Yeah, she's also she's into everything right now. She's got a women bracket a men's bracket she was sweating last night's iowa game <laughs> so yeah she's not she's more totally than the executives it. at espn but she's uh she's fully we might have to have her on as a guest she has strong thoughts on the one hit wonders okay great she's welcome so we are going to update our bracket of one hit wonders in this portion of the show is brought to you by wesley financial stuck in a timeshare and want out contact wesley financial group now and get a free timeshare exit information kit at wesley financial group dot com okay so this is the round of 32. What region is the CJ? Is this our uh, our last call region? So thank you so much. You guys <laughs> voted, and now here are the results, and now you can vote again to see who moves on to the Sweet 16. So in this bracket, the last call region of the Maggie and Perloff one-hit wonders bracket, the number one overall seed in this region moves on. It's Baby Got Back. I like big butts, and I cannot lie. You other brothers can't deny. And yeah, when a girl walks in with an itty-bitty waist and a round thing in your face, you get sprung. Want to pull up? To- All right. That goes up against eighth-seeded Kung Fu Fighting. It was Kung Fu Fighting. <laughs> Those kids were fast as lightning. In fact, it was a little bit frightening. All right. The Maggie and Perloff bracket of one-hit wonders. We're in the last call region. Number five seed, 99 Luff Balloons. With- no, 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 no. German we, version. <laughs> can we get a translator? Um, These are second round matchups? Yes. This is tough. I know. It's a, this it's a is heavy tough. bracket. Uh, the fifth seed, 99 Luff Balloons, goes up against fourth seeded. Who let the dogs out? Mm. Who let the dogs out? Who, who, who? <laughs> <laughs> who let the dogs out? <laughs> That's the sound of street <laughs> cred <laughs> leaving the building. <laughs> who let the dogs out? <laughs> who, 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 who? Last. Yep, and it only got worse from there. Getting some nice voiceover work from that, by the way. Number 11 seed in this region, closing time. I know who want to take me home. I know who want to take me home. You're welcome, America. That will now be stuck in your head for the rest <laughs> of the day, unless it's replaced by the 14 seed, Play That Funky Music. Okay, and the final a matchup in this region, 10th seed, the 10th seed, 8675309. And that goes up against the second seed, Come Clean. Come on, Eileen. Come on, Eileen. It says, come clean here. I'm like, who is come clean? <laughs> Clearly, they say come clean. Here. Yeah, that's a no hit wonder. <laughs> come really clean. Funny because I always think, how do people read stuff on air that they haven't first read through? How do people get, you know, go bleep yourself, Sandy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how does okay, that Ron Burgundy. To professional broadcasters. <laughs> Ron Burgundy. It, it just happened to the me. The number two seed, come clean. <laughs> <laughs>
so who's the professional broadcaster here? Clearly not me. By uh, way, come on, are, Eileen. Those are two. That could be the final matchup. Eight, uh, six, seven, five, everybody, three, nine. Everybody loves that song, and everyone loves Come On, Eileen. Come On, Eileen is like, when you see a commercial about one-hit wonders, that's the song they play. Yeah. yeah. I really go back to the committee criticisms. That's a tough. Those two shouldn't be this close in round two. There this was, deserves a sweet 16 or an elite eight. Matchup. I think we, we failed to acknowledge the power of the 80s in this contest. It does I mean, seem they're like, well represented in this bracket. Maybe so. not. Yeah, but it almost seems like every one hit wonder comes from. I think VH1 had a big say in this. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> and now you have a say in it because you can go to at Maggie and Pearl and on Twitter and you can vote. To see who moves on to the Sweet 16, Andrew Bogish is here with headlines. Hello. Hello again. So the Iowa Hawkeyes made just one field goal during the fourth quarter last night, but they hit 14 free throws and they fought off West Virginia 64-54 to return to the Sweet 16. Caitlin Clark scoring 32 in her final home game. To me, this is like one of the hardest rounds in the NCAA tournament. Everybody's really good. You're expected to win. You're on your home court. We have all the pressure in the world. Um, they have absolutely nothing to lose to come in here and upset us. And, um, you know, that happened my sophomore year. Last year, we were in a game that was even closer than this one. This win sets up a meeting with Colorado in Albany on Saturday. UCLA surviving a close game, 67-63 over Creighton, the second-seeded Bruins We'll see LSU in Albany this weekend. And UConn held off Syracuse yesterday, 72-64 for its spot in the Sweet 16. The Huskies will face Duke in Portland this weekend. Without men's games yesterday, we got coaching news instead. Stanford hiring Washington State's Kyle Smith, the reigning Pac-12 Coach of the Year. Danny Sprinkle goes from Utah State to Washington and Vandy chose JMU's Mark Byington. Hey, sorry, did you see the Pac-12 because they're doing so well in this tournament that they're getting they get paid out, you yep. know, like you get paid out as a conference when your teams do well in the tournament and so now Washington State and Oregon State are getting like 20 million dollars for them just because like Arizona's doing well <laughs> in the tournament. <laughs> Where does that money go now? To the conference. Yeah. The, to they, the schools. To the two it. schools. Oh, okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure if the actual executives or whatever got to pay out from it. Well, somehow. maybe some administrative fees and stuff. Yeah, because that would that would suck. No, the thing that you get. It's Ipe is Mizahara as their new uh, commissioner, <laughs> know, right? deputy commissioner. It's like the AD getting a 500K <laughs> bonus for a Sweet 16. And what did he do to make that happen? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, College the, administrators uh, are just, they have the lowest approval rating probably in America. Yep. Like, Both sides of the aisle have been dunking on college sports for the last yeah. five years. And we're going to ADs. I'm talking about even just like the people who do your registrar at your college. Like, does anybody <laughs> like any college administrator? Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I know, I'm sure it's a tough job, but they don't really seem to please anyone. Well, yeah. also, it escalates quickly, you know, yeah. because all of a sudden you never know what's coming when it's a college campus. Because you could have controversy is just around every corner, oh, yeah. whether it's athletic stuff, whether it's yep. political stuff. I mean, being on a college campus right now can be kind of dicey. I we're not going to get too into this, but I have a close relative who works at a college campus. Apparently, for every professor, there is nine administrators on every college campus oh, right boy. now. And it's, as EJ said, it's harder to get any of them to do absolutely anything. Okay. I will drop that. <laughs> okay, thanks. The Boston Celtics and their nine-game win streak went to Atlanta last night, built a 68-38 second quarter lead and lost to the Hawks, 121-18. Head coach Joe Mazzula, matter of fact, post game. Uh, we got off to a really good start, uh, but it's a good lesson when you let a team hang around. And uh, you know they made you know mar those margin plays, you know points off turnovers, three pointers, offensive rebounds, and uh, credit to them for you know battling back. It's like he doesn't care. DeAndre Hunter, <laughs> Wait, Atlanta. Where, this game was where <laughs> in Atlanta, up thirty, lost by two, and he's like, yeah, you know they they made the margin plays, no biggie. <laughs> See you Thursday. I was just like, what did, when did the Celtics get to town? Oh, you're thinking they had too much fun in Atlanta? Mm, a little bit of an yeah, Atlanta. Just, I don't know. A little Sunday night action yeah, in Atlanta. At least with a bad Monday night on the court. That's, that's in play. I could definitely see that. I'm just saying, so they were in Chicago. Whatever. It doesn't matter. They lost. <laughs> uh, DeAndre Hunter led Atlanta with 24 last night. He and the Hawks keep their five-and-a-half game lead on the Nets for the last play-in spot in the East. Brooklyn, a 96-88 win 
over the ghost of Rafer Alston in Toronto, Dick Bridges <laughs> scoring 13 <laughs> for the net. Well, the great. I love that. Well, Perloff well, thinks Dick Bridges like that's a regular name. Wait, like, right. Is it? Can we let's back up here a second? You're giving that you said the Nets are five games out of the five and a half. Out. They're 27 and 45. <laughs> Do we even need to mention them here, or is this a pro Nets bias here? No, this is a pro, actually a pro Hawks update because they keep their lead, their safe lead for that last playoff spot. Man, how is the East awful? You have nothing but like title contenders in the play and in the West and the East. Oof. And what I saw this this morning. The Lakers right now are 39 and 22, I believe, or something. 30, 30. 39 and 32. 32. That would have been, this time last year, they would have been fourth in the West with that record. And this year, they're ninth. That's how good the West is. Totally stacked. Yeah. I I love how the problem is regular season games in the NBA. Meanwhile, we have teams that are 27 and 45 still in the playoff hunt. (laughs) Right. And and again, the balance is unbelievable. The East play-in is completely unnecessary. The Hawks don't, they don't need to be in the postseason. The West has like 18 All Stars mm-hmm. and five future Hall of Famers out of those four teams. Like the yep. Suns are the eighth best yeah. team in the West right now. Counter argument: The Heat are actually seven. They're in the plan, and they will be in the NBA Finals. Of heat course, culture <laughs> because no of Heat culture. culture. <laughs> no chance. Uh, Luka Doncic had 29 points, 11 rebounds, eight assists in Dallas's 115-105 win in Utah. The Nuggets took care of the Grizzlies 128-103 improving to 15-2 and two since the All-Star break. And the Wizards have their first three-game winning streak since January of 2023, thanks to a 107-105 victory in Chicago. Dolphins head coach Mike McDaniel said yesterday his team has made an offer to free agent wideout Odell Beckham Jr. And in addition to banning the swivel hip drop tackle, NFL owners yesterday tweaking the coach's challenge rules Coaches now earn a third challenge if they're right on one of the first two tries, not on both. In non-Shohei Otani baseball news, Yankee infielders DJ uh, Yankee infielder DJ LeMahieu, Toronto closer Jordan Romano, starting the season on IL with foot and elbow issues, respectively. A huge win for the Golden Knights last night, two-one in OT over the Blues. Vegas now leads St. Louis by five points for the last wild card spot out west and. An update on a story we mentioned about two weeks ago. The missing Yaramir Yager bobbleheads have been recovered. The Penguins first telling us the giveaways went missing between arriving in the Pittsburgh area and being delivered to the arena. Yesterday, they announced the items were recovered with the help of a, quote, special cargo recovery team. No other details, including the ransom, were reported, (laughs) but the bobbleheads are now back in the rightful okay. hands you of the call Penguins. Peter Schwartz. He would know. <laughs> well, he'll have one soon. Yeah. Peter has never been a giveaway he doesn't love. But here's the thing. So this was simply a tracking number issue is sort of how they're painting it. Like, ah, oh, these 18,000 bobbleheads just sort of, uh, they got in the wrong. I, maybe. I prefer the idea of a SWAT team, like coming through the roof <laughs> of some shady warehouse. Yeah. Ropes, they drop in. There's a box. There's an illegal poker game going exactly. on. Exactly. On top of the box of bobbleheads. <laughs> box of bobbleheads. And, and they just take them and they go. And there's Ipe in the corner making a bet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ipe is so somehow in part of the story. Yeah. Ipe House somehow just has head in his hands because he's now <laughs> losing to all these poker players. Because apparently he sucks at all this stuff. I mean, clearly, I mean, I don't know about clearly, but. Someone thought this was another kind of shipment and then realized they were bobblehead and they were like, damn it. Oh, they thought it was uh, a yeah, high was, end. They thought it was like jewels or something, yeah. you know? <laughs> jewels. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> jewels. They're like, they're Jewel like, thieves. Yeah. They're they're like, our intel was bad. <laughs> but yeah, they, they move jewels a lot on tractor trailers. Everyone Where knows the you, you, s- <laughs> you smuggle heroin in bobbleheads. That's a fact as old as time, right? How do you in think- Yamir Yager bobbleheads? There's oh my heroin God. in there? What do you? How do you think Escobar built his empire? With through bobbleheads? Bobble? Yeah, with Sammy Sosa Bob. No, I'm just kidding. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, through uh, Cece Sabathia as Yoda. Do you guys bobble not head. watch shows about cartels? They they do take everyday products and sneak sneak drugs yeah. in through them. Well, I remember bobbleheads would be a great idea. <laughs> Funko she- Pops too. That's just another one. The, the heads are bigger. <laughs> oh, right. Good well, idea. Actually, I got one of those that are secret Santa. We should crack it open and see if there's anything in there. Um. I remember the movie Crash, was it? 
no, the, not the, Crash, not Crash, not Crash. Uh, the one about what, oh, about the drugs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Catherine Zeta Jones was in yeah, it. And, um, and the kid from that '70s show was yes, in it. Topher Grace. Topher Grace. What the heck was that movie called? Anyway, were they do, doing? Well, that? they had that was part of the way they were smuggling it. It was like children's toys. Yes, they dissolved exactly. in That's water what I was and made it into cocaine. Right. I didn't they have traffic? A, was yeah, the traffic. I think there was a Mario oh. Lemieux bobblehead in that. No, <laughs> <laughs> is that where they got the idea? And then twenty years later, they executed it. Yeah. Um, no, I have no idea, but. Uh, that would be a cool movie right now. Like bobbleheads, like a kid's like, oh, mommy, I finally got my um, Mookie Betts bobblehead. And it takes a big sniff. Oh, God. <laughs> I don't God, know. That's dark. <laughs> wow. Jeez, bro. I'm just saying, like, I, I, I watch too much of Narcos. I'm sorry. Just act in movies. Don't write them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, by the way. Happy Gilmore 2. I was going to say, did you get a call from Sandler? No. Everyone knows Perloff has been in many Sandler yeah. movies, including Hustle was the last one where you had like four lines. It was amazing. Uh, Dan Patrick talked about it yesterday on the show. Is he going to be in it? He He's wasn't in the first one, though. No, that was before his relationship started with Adam Sandler. So he said that he called Sam and joking, said, uh, how many days should I set aside for the movie? Uh, this is on DP show. And Dan said that Sandler said, three days, Danny, you're going to play yourself. Yes. Awesome. Um, that being said, uh, since I am not on the Dan Patrick show, the odds are I'm not getting in it and I'm not getting you guys in it. <laughs> That's okay. I, we never expected to be along yeah. for the ride. I, I was like, do I send that text to Dan? I'm like, Dan, I'm available in May. <laughs> I'd be like, uh, I don't think so, McLovin. <laughs> not happening. I mean, but Dan and none of the other Danettes were in Hustle and you were in Hustle. You played reporter number two and you executed flawlessly. Dan was in Hustle. He had Dan a, was in Hustle? Yeah, he had a scene. He was playing himself. Uh, he was on, on camera. It was a it, as if it was a clip from the show talking oh, about yes, yes, Bo right. Cruz. Right. So Dan pretty yes, much. Dan was Dan's been it. in 23 Sandler movies. but I 23? Think, yeah, something like that. It's great. Wow. He said that now. Maybe I'm exaggerating. It's a lot. I mean, That's he's been Sandler's in... Sandler's making 15 a year. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, listen, two are good. And by the way, I, I could rate them if we ever want to do that. <laughs> Dan and Hubie Halloween is drop dead funny. He is, yes. He, he's a hysterical actor. For some reason, he's so deadpan. Uh, anyway, that's enough. I, I can say whatever. I'm not getting the Happy Gilmore 2 here. I think no matter how much I compliment Dan's no, acting. Just, uh, no, Dan is a great actor. He's great at everything. I think that your relationship with Sandler, though, has now transcended right. nope. DP. No. <laughs> <laughs> Dan uh, and Adam are really, they have a really cool relationship. Yeah. This is all This is all about Dan. Uh, Dan is funny. He has relationships with Will Ferrell. Yes. Legit. Friends, Darius Rucker and Adam Sandler, among others, but those three have always stood out to me. I mean, yeah, well, there's, I mean, I'm sure that something transcends it, but there's something big in common with those three guys. What's that? Well, they're about the same age, aren't they? Uh, and I would no, imagine, no, not exactly. I don't, I'm not sure that's what it was. Uh, I think, well, maybe no, they the were big Sports that, Center fans. That's that, what I was right. saying. It's like that's the peak, I would imagine, of both their sports fandom before their no. careers may have kicked off, and also Dan and Keith and his, I mean, Dan's and Continued to be super famous and, and successful, but that Sports Center peak was mm. got a lot of. Dan helped get a lot of people really hooked on sports and yeah. scratch that itch for a lot. Oh, of people. absolutely, absolutely. I don't. You know, it's funny. The Will Ferrell thing. He was a big fan of the Dan Patrick show when it broke off, and because it was in Fox Sports LA. Oh, got it. So he. That's how. And also, too, Dan's just a great dinner guest too. I think these guys. Good stories. Yeah, I mean, it's famous people have a different way of hanging out that I don't really understand. Like, You've been privy to a lot of this, though, I, and you well, still don't yeah, get it? but I'm like a wallflower and nervous as heck. Dan is the life of the party, and him and Darius are old friends. Like they just do things differently. These famous people, yeah. trust me. Uh, yeah, whatever Dan has that quality. It's tough to replicate. So, and also, he's really funny. Have you ever seen him as the water slide guy in Grown Ups 1? Oh, my God. It is... <laughs> he wears these... I'll just one more role. He wears this Larry Bird outfit in one movie. I don't even remember what it was. He wears short shorts. Dan will do anything for Sailor. So that's why he gets it. I would love to be in Happy Gilmore. Happy Gilmore is an important movie to you, right, Maggie? Definitely. I mean, Billy Madison, Happy Gilmore, It what it represented was... Billy Madison is the first one for Sandler, and it was such a huge thing because you're coming off of his SNL yes. where it's the Denise show, and he's doing all the fun songs, and he's opera man, and he's pickle with a mustache guy, a, mustache, a pickle for a mustache guy, and he's doing all these amazing things. Then he goes to Billy Madison, and it's an unbelievable hit. I mean, yeah. awesome movie, hilarious. It's hard to make the second one, especially yeah. for comedies. And the fact that he followed up Billy Madison with Happy Gilmore, it's like two bangers back to back. It's like having two great albums back to back yeah. for for a band. And so for me, that was right in my wheelhouse of being like, you know, 10 years old, 12 years old. Probably. Yeah. 
No, it's it's a great movie. That was the second movie. What was the third? Was Wedding I think Singer? Was the third? Wedding Singer was third? Jeez, I mean, what a start! Dan came and on, and then fifty, and then a Big Daddy, and then Fifty First Dates. Like, yeah. it, it's funny we we joke now, Sandler. Oh, he puts out fifteen movies a year, blah blah blah. But the the first part of that IMDb is ridiculous. So Dan came came on a little bit later because Oberman was supposed to be in one of the movies and he couldn't make it. So Adam called Dan, and Dan was so funny that he brought him on every movie. Wow! Well, and then your boy got into Hustle. Yep. You did great. I mean, you guys—you were really legitimately good in that movie. You guys remember me? You're an actor, not a not a not a radio host. But the week of was probably my best role. Non-speaking. I was person number three walking across the parking lot. (laughs) I mean, you guys see me walk. It was dramatic. (laughs) (laughs) It's distinct. Yes. Stand out because it rained. So all the we were supposed to all have speaking lines, and they all got canceled because it rained. So they couldn't do the outdoor shoot. So they had us walking across the parking lot. Movie business is rough, Maggie. <laughs> one day you're on top. <laughs> yeah. Well, next, on top. The next you're doing a one-hit wonder bracket on the radio. <laughs> Talking about eight six seven five three zero nine versus. Uh, and come clean. Come come clean. <laughs> come, come clean, Eileen. By the way, who let the dog out for ninety nine Luft balloons? Ooh, I'm di- I'm going to follow that all day long. Eight five five two one two four CBS. That could be the radio clip. That Sam, the Happy Gilmore's listening to, and he goes, I got to get back to playing golf. And it pushes him back to the course. <laughs> can we sort of... Oh, he's listening to yeah. the Maggie yeah, Perloff like, show and forces yeah. him back to yeah. golf. Yeah. <laughs> can we DJ that and sort of mesh the two songs? <laughs> 99, who Pete? let the dogs out? <laughs> who let the Check 99 out? balloons yeah. out, really? Is the, All right, Kaplan, get on that. There are, say, Dr. Dre. I'm sure he's got nothing to do. 855-2124-CBS coming up. The latest draft rumor that Perloff is obsessed with. We'll get to that next. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. <clears throat> the 
This is Maggie Gray with an Odyssey Sports Minute. This is Maggie Gray with a CBS Sports Minute. Shohei Otani says he is the victim. Otani read a prepared statement yesterday claiming his innocence and that his translator, Ipe Mizahara, repeatedly lied and stole money to cover gambling debts with a bookmaker. What Otani didn't answer, how did he... got to read here from Anthony. This is Andrew Perloff with an Odyssey. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Back on Maggie and Perloff. So earlier we had a discussion about the number two overall pick that J.J. McCarthy is now possibly going to the Washington Commanders. But there's another draft rumor. We're doing a daily draft rumor here, Maggie, yep. until late April in Detroit. I got to tell you, yesterday it came from the owners meeting and our guy, Sean Payton. I think that's realistic. I think it's realistic. I know your report suggested otherwise, but it's realistic. Well, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> yeah, no, it did. I would. <laughs> I, I think it's realistic. Um, what's, what's hard to predict, though, is like what's on the receiving end. You know, I think it's good to be Monty today at Arizona. Sorry, I should have prefaced that with the question. The question was to Sean Payton, do you think it's possible the Broncos will move up in the draft, presumably to get the quarterback they want? I'll tell you, that's absolutely happening. The fact that he just said, have you ever heard a coach say that's realistic? And the guys, the guy actually gave him an opportunity to backtrack. He's like, no, no, it's realistic. It's happening. So it seems like he might want to go up to number four. Look at the quarterbacks on his team right now. He has Jared Stidham and Ben DiNucci. That's the depth chart, Maggie. Yeah, I know. Not good. Although they did sign Jared Stidham last year, like on the first day of free agency. But I get, no, I get it's it. It's got to be quarterback. And I, if he's trading a four, it's got to be trying to get J.J. McCarthy. Well, but here's my question. This is a, if this is true and Sean Payton is just like putting out their business this yes. early before yes. the draft, right? And this is just... I got to be honest, I am really disagreeing with Sean Payton's media strategy since he got the job at Denver. <laughs> I am really disagreeing with it. I, I would calling out Nathaniel Hackett in the way that he did, great for us, not good for him. Uh-huh. Uh, how the Russell Wilson stuff was handled, I did not think, you know, opened himself up to criticism there. And now you would say it's good to be Monty Osifor, who's the general manager of the Cardinals, so you're implying you're just moving up to four. So does that mean you know something about the New England Patriots are not open for business at three? Or what is going on? Like, I don't know why you would put this out there. To me, like, I, if Sean Payton is actually being this candid and forthcoming, what the hell are you doing, man? Why would you ever? You're putting your GM in a really bad spot by making this public. Uh, and he needs help anyway. George Payton has been is underwater as the uh, GM of the Broncos. It's been misstep after misstep. Possible that Sean Payton's playing chess while you're stuck here on checkers and a. What's you know, the chess move? Oh, he is manipulating this draft like nobody's business. No, I have no idea. Oh, what I was say, that's why it's chess. I, I, I love a chess. That's move. why it's chess because we don't understand at this time. I love it if he, they really want like Marvin Harrison or something, and he's trying to get someone else to trade into four. I have so, no I don't know what he's doing. I don't know. We should keep a close eye. This is it's late March. This is exactly when trades happen. Somebody's gonna move up this week probably to get into that. Well, we if already saw be- the Vikings do it. The Vikings uh, already made a trade to get a second first round right, pick right. No, to but try to move up. 
this is when the Trey Lance trade happened. Right. This is when I think this might be when the Bears Panther. I have to double check when that happened. So anyway, someone's going to try and get in the top five because clearly EJ and I have this bet. Will four and a half quarterbacks go in the first round? I heard that that is the over under that's actually in Vegas. EJ says under, I say over. Over is at minus 280 right now. So it does seem like the Broncos are taking a quarterback. Everyone's in the quarterback business. You do bring up a good question. Why does Sean Payton have to share this with us? But then again, <laughs> might keep this I one a little know. closer to the fest. Dude. It feels like a little like an old Bill Parcell, like just like crotchety old coach who's just like, I don't even care anymore. <laughs> I'm just gonna say it. Yeah, <laughs> that's not who I want. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, unless I'm getting Bill Parcell's results consistently. Well, I mean, that's Sean Payton. Obviously, is a Bill Parcell's mentee, fashions himself as a new Bill Parcells. I, I, you know, you're in the media. You're supposed to like honest coaches. But I don't know. I I can't take this at its face value. Or maybe, I don't know, but maybe Sean Payton had too much coffee and now he's just spilling, like, the entire Broncos draft board. He was in the media for a year. Maybe he still wants to get clicks. I think he probably still wanted to stay in the media. And the Broncos made him an offer. Oh, no. He he was interviewing all over the place. Yeah, I'm sure he's going to love starting over with a rookie quarterback. That's exactly what he signed up for. All right, coming up, lots more to do, including uh, Shohei Otani. The latest from his press conference yesterday. We've got a Okay. This is Andrew Perloff with an Odyssey Sports Minute sponsored by LL Flooring. LL Flooring, every step covered.
One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. He can run the 40 faster than Tom Brady. He got a perfect score on the Wonderlick. They are Maggie and Perloff on CBS Sports Radio. Shohei Otani says he is the victim in all of this. Hey, welcome to the show, Maggie Gray, Andrew Perloff. Perloff yesterday, Otani, 12 minutes with prepared statement. Did go off the statement a little bit at the end. Talked about the betrayal he's feeling, the shock he's feeling that his translator, now former translator, Ipe Mizuhara, had been in Shohei's uh, statements lying stealing. Shohei knew nothing about any of this. This is the story now. Shohei left no gray area. He didn't know this was all Ipe Mizahara. And Shohei said, I've never bet on sports in my life. So this is why I believe Shohei. Because he is set up now. He knows there's going to be an investigation by the MLB, by the IRS, the feds, we know. The IRS. Uh, so he knows that everybody is going to be looking around every corner. He's saying, I never did any of this. Now, he has to know that somebody can find out if he did do any of this. So would he have the gall to come up there and say, I never bet on sports, knowing that there was proof out there that he actually did bet on sports? I can't imagine he would do that. Wouldn't he just shut up and hide? I don't know. We just saw a translator who was his best friend every day had the gall to maybe steal $4.5 million from him, stand up in front of the Dodgers clubhouse with a mea culpa that allegedly was still a lie, which is that he had came clean that Otani's covering his debts. Right. And now Otani's saying that's not true. A lot of people have done brazen things. Mizuhara, obviously, gambling addict or something right. because he did the ultimate brazen thing. Yes, this would be Otani almost matching that in his defense. Right. right? But there's also some uh, rumors that and reports actually that he had lied, the translator had lied about his past. That's true. That plays into it. Convenient reports, by the way, that the translator. Yeah, never <laughs> went to a college that never, he claimed to yes. go to, never worked for the Red Sox like he claimed or the so, Yankees. Right. It seems like he could be the impulsive liar. Sure. The. I heard him compared to the talented Mr. Ripley, uh, Matt Damon's character in the movie where he basically steals the life from his rich friend, that this guy was in fantasy land or something. So obviously he's going to take the fall. But if Shohei, Shohei said, I never bet on sports anywhere. If anyone can find a receipt or find a picture of him in a casino or something, I, I just think that's a gigantic risk for Shohei to take. And to me... If he's lying, wow, is he setting himself up for trouble? Well, yeah, I mean, unless he really didn't bet. But again, he left no gray area, yet that doesn't mean there still aren't questions here that Shohei might want to answer or need to answer at some point, maybe not publicly, but certainly to investigators. First and foremost, how did your translator have access to your yep. bank accounts? Yep. I mean, and that's not... That's number one. And even if you want to say, and Perloff, you said this before, they're, they they seem like they were even closer than family, right? Ipe 
and Shohei, the, the, the player and the translator, so close. But even when you're so close with somebody, does there's like a threshold there, right? That giving someone your bank account info or giving them access or letting them be like a, you know, a sign off on your name. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, so somebody wants like a, ask you for a headshot, sign headshot and, yeah. oh, okay, here's Ipe, sign it for Shohei again. That would actually also be a scandal. But this is multiple $500,000 wire transfers. This is not a small, that's not a white lie. Ipe was his voice to America. I know. I mean, that is a huge, you're saying it's, of course it's closer than family. There's nobody in my family who, who speaks for me. Shohei had to trust him 100% because he was basically saying, you know, he had to trust him in his translation. Uh, he had to trust him that he was going to handle this gigantic media throng that is around Shohei every day. There had to be such a level of trust. It's incredible. Much more that I don't, you know, I like my brothers, but I don't trust them like that. <laughs> I'm not going to let them go to a press conference and speak for me. <laughs> Uh, I, I think this is a very unique relationship between translator and player. No doubt. So David Sampson joined us earlier in the show. He is the president, former president of Miami Marlins. So he's dealt with Ichiro Suzuki and his translator that he said was a really positive relationship. But even he understood the closeness of a foreign player and their translator. And even Sampson couldn't believe that Ipe would have had access to his bank account. And the biggest question that we needed answered is, how does the interpreter have access to your bank account? I've worked with Japanese players. I've worked with Hispanic players. I've worked with white players and black players. You can hear anything you want about how players have so much money that they don't know where their money is and they rely on all of their friends and family to take care of their money. But four and a half million dollars missing from bank transfers. It's not like this is a cash business. You've got banks involved. You've got authentication requirements for ID. Yeah, I mean, this is, if it's true that Ipe Mizuhara, Shohei Otani's translator, was just the perpetrator of this and Otani had no idea, this guy's a mastermind, you know? Like, how do you get someone's ID? How do you how do you verify this stuff for $500,000 wire transfer? Mastermind? I mean, it seems like low-key identity theft in a sense. I, I don't think that's that hard to do. I think he definitely had a lot of Shohei's passwords. Okay, but then, I mean, we're talking about multiple $500,000 wire transfers here. Like, the fact that he could just have a password, there's no much more authentication than that, is a little scary. I don't know. I was yelling up to my wife yesterday, hey, what's the Amazon password? <laughs> that different. happens every day. It is a little different, but I do think there was a level of trust that makes this at least feasible. Also, if this guy was a gambling addict and if, if the narrative is true that he was lying about all this and theft, that kind of theft happens all the time. Right. All so, the time do uh, people steal from people they work for. Oh, I get it. I, I know that we've had this kind of thing happen before, but this is the other part of it to me that is just hard for me to wrap my brain around, which is you have a relationship with somebody who is it's so close that you would trust them with your bank information. And that's just one of the things. I mean, you're right. Shohei trusted Ipe to be the his uh, voice to America. And Shohei has so much at stake and so much pressure. And he trusted Ipe as the guy. And you're this close. You meals together, drive together to the stadium, working out together, everything. And Shohei saying he had no idea this guy was gambling, let alone the debts. Maybe you don't know about the debts. You have no idea that this guy is into sports betting. It's just like knowing about somebody's hobbies. I know men don't maybe communicate like women do. Like, you know, I know like everything about my friends and we talk a lot. Maybe guys don't share as much about their personal lives. I'm, I'm willing to acknowledge that. But wouldn't it come up in even casual conversation? By the way, I'm watching this Premier League game or I love college football now or the NFL. Mm. Like none of this would come up. I have no idea. I mean, I'm not sure that Shohei... I, I have no idea what Shohei and his translator talk about on a Tuesday afternoon. I don't have the slightest clue. I, you're right, that does follow. It makes perfect sense. But, I, again, I'm not in the room with them. I'm not sure I understand that relationship. Yeah, I, I just... I, You know, if you're sports betting, and it's to this degree, where you're betting on, and Ipe said this, college football, international soccer, the NFL, and the NBA... Like you're a sports nut. <laughs> you have to be. And you so you wouldn't be talking about that or in terms of point spreads or anything like Shohei would say, I never knew he gambled. That's right. crazy to me. But I mean, listen, there are many famous gambling scandals. People have gone down from gambling. And no one had this any idea of the scope of it. I mean, I'm, 
I think of this building. I mean, I don't think yeah. anyone understood what was happening with Craig. I heard Craig Carton talk about that. He was hiding things. No, I know, but everyone also knew he was open and honest about how he liked to play blackjack. Yes. So that part of it, you knew. Did maybe the compulsion yeah. you didn't know. And again, Craig has talked about all this stuff personally. Very uh, much, oh, yeah. uh, publicly rather. But it's not like you were shocked to know that he had stepped foot in a casino. You know, Shohei is saying he's shocked to know that Ipe was betting on sports. Meanwhile, they spend every day attached to the hip. That doesn't square to me. I hear you. I don't know. I don't know a lot of people's sports gambling habits. I have no idea. And especially nowadays, because it's so widespread. I think it's taken a big leap with legal gambling. That's I don't, true. you know, vices, people sometimes keep quote unquote vices to themselves. Like, I don't really, really know how much people around me drop on sports gambling. It could be yeah. a lot more. I mean, there could be people in this room right now or, you know, in six figure holes. <laughs> <laughs> Are you looking at me? Uh, I know. Well, over here. Now we know everybody's pension for one hit wonders, but I don't think that's really a vice. Uh, <laughs> we've just learned. I think <laughs> dropping money is better than who let the dogs out. <laughs> I was going to say, now we just know that Perloff's favorite, favorite band is Dexie's Midnight Runner. Um, Come clean, Dexie's Midnight Runner. <laughs> so the question, we have a poll question out there. Do you believe Shohei? Um, the early results on this were not good. EJ, I don't know if you want to update us on what's going on. Uh now we've got some one-hit wonder stuff. All right, so oh. still not great for Shohei on the Maggie and Perloff poll. I've got the results here if you'd like me to read them. I was about to give them to you. Okay, go ahead. On the, on the result of what, the Shohei poll? Yep. Yeah, so Shohei Otani, we asked a very simple question. Do you believe Shohei Otani? 22% say yes, 71 per, 70, excuse me, 77% say no. Yeah. We kind of butchered that entire poll reading right there, <laughs> but that's okay. Seventy-eight percent of our respondents said no; they do not yeah. believe Otani. Yeah. That's a landslide. I right, let's People do this. We're not buying it. I voted yes. I think I'm the. Am I the only one in the room who actually believe Shohei? I didn't want to skew the 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 very scientific results we have, so I did not vote. <laughs> I also uh, wait, did which not. way would you have voted? No, I don't believe him. Yeah. No way. I don't believe some of it. Mm -hmm. I be I believe that sh that he's not the one who is making the bets. I I do believe that. I just can't, don't believe he didn't know any of this. That that part of it to me is is a little bit beyond the pale. But again, um, we're gonna find out more because Shohei also said he's gonna cooperate with any investigation, and there are going to be multiple. So that's the latest from Shohei. We can get to the Dodgers side of it in a moment because I thought they handled this really really poorly as a franchise. But just as the as you say, the dust was settling at Otani, but basically just as the Otani press conference was wrapping up around six o'clock Eastern last night, we got another betting scandal in sports, at least the tip of the iceberg on what's on what could be pretty big. So Jonte Porter is a two-way player, played college at Mizzou, is the brother of Michael Porter Jr. on the world champion Denver Nuggets. And a story came across yesterday on ESPN that there had been some unusual betting activity on Jonte Porter's prop bets. And when they say unusual, that's kind of an understatement. Jonte Porter is a rarely used, again, two-way player that is essentially a glorified bench warmer for the Toronto Raptors. And there were two games, one in January and one earlier this month, where the unders on his prop bets, and that was points, rebounds, and assists, the unders on his prop bets hit in a huge way because the player took himself out of the game for two different reasons. One was like re-aggravating an eye injury. The other was for some kind of illness. So not that he was pulled because the team pulled him. He didn't hit these marks because he pulled himself out of the game. And in both of those nights, in both of those games in question, his prop bets were the biggest winners of the entire night of NBA sports gambling, according to, uh, I believe it was DraftKings. Yeah. Uh, so here's the thing. We don't know yeah. the total amount, but it seems like how on earth did this guy think that he wouldn't get caught if millions of dollars, I don't know again, we don't know if it's millions, but if all this money came through, you have to be able to think that through, that this is not going to work. <laughs> I think he might have been, who knows what's going on, but he's either desperate or... I have no idea, but this seems to me like this is the worst nightmare for the league. And here's the thing about it, right? Shohei is one example of a really famous person getting wrapped up in a scandal like this or Pete Rose or whatever these famous, famous people. What's more likely to happen is guys like this. 
guys who are making $450,000 a year, which is a great living if you're a regular person, but if you're a basketball player, it pales in comparison to what a lot of guys are making. So it's always going to be, not always, it's likely going to be the guy you don't see coming. It's not going to be Jason Tatum would have no reason to do anything or take any risk like this because he's going to make a max contract of $250 million. Jonte Porter, who's making $450,000, could find himself in a compromising position. And it's things like this with prop bets uh, where the unders hit, where he's taking himself out of the game. I, I, I'm nervous, very nervous about this if I'm the commissioner because this there could be a guy like this on every team. Well, okay, yeah, counter-argument, though, is now we can track all these bets where that could have been sure. happening. Why couldn't that have been happening when illegal betting was going on? I get, probably prop bets have grown a lot. And the other thing, too, is prop bets are harder to hide. I mean, if it, you bet on the Super Bowl, again, much harder to throw sure. a big game. Much less money comes in on uh, Jonte Porter props. So... There is a little bit of an insurance there. Like, you you can't really do that. If you're a bench warmer making $400,000 and all of a sudden millions of dollars start moving on you, th- right. they're going to catch it every single time. Right. But th- this happened now twice. They didn't say anything after the first game. The first game yeah. was in January, and we didn't hear a peep. Now it's been the second game, so now you've got a bit of a pattern. Yeah. I mean, I for me, I think the Temple betting scandal is way bigger because they were actually throwing games on a spread. I, I'd i like to see Allegedly. the numbers. Right, right. They were reportedly, uh, they're being investigated right now. I I really would like to see how much money was here. How much money can you actually bet on a prop bet? So I do think you could make the argument that legalized gambling actually helps because you're going to be uncovering this kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, that's possible. That's what the league will say. And they'll say that's why they need that like 1% integrity tax and all of that stuff. I understand. I think there were some numbers on this that people started putting in like, usually the max on a prop is like a thousand dollars. I think it's very widespread. Uh, it's very different in all sorts of different places. Right. Like okay. I can't even most most props. I don't even. I can't even do in New York. Right. But like for example, we talked yesterday about somebody in the media who put a hundred thousand yeah. dollars on Iowa versus Holy Cross. You can't put a hundred thousand dollars on a prop. You can't do yeah, yeah, anything yeah. that big. Like a draft prop. Anything. Something like a draft prop where also it's not like somebody knows what the answer is, or you can't. Uh, they, I think they don't they limit the time of the national anthem too because there's a rehearsal before. Like, there's definitely like these are not normal bets. So we're talking about Jonte Porter. He is a player for the Toronto Raptors who's now being investigated. He's a bench warmer who's under props, uh, points, rebounds, assists came in um, and unusual betting activity around his unders, and he had taken himself out of the game because of an illness and re-aggravating an eye injury, not because he got taken out of the game by the coaches. According to this ESPN article, uh, multiple betting accounts attempted to bet large amounts, upwards of $10,000 and $20,000 on Porter's unders in the January game against the LA Clippers. Betting limits on player props vary by sports book and customer, but are typically around $1,000 to $2,000. So now you're getting a $10,000, $20,000 bet on whether or not Jonte Porter is going to get five rebounds in a game or a parlay of five rebounds, like, you know, eight points and three assists or something. Right. Um, Fishy. The, totally. But again, we're talking ten and $20,000. How much do you think you're moving on the tournament games? $100 million? Yeah, crazy. So I do think... Yeah, this is this is a very embarrassing one, but I think the league's going to say, "Listen, we caught this guy immediately." It's so if we. You and I said the same thing last night. I'm like, "How obvious was this this move? Did he think he was going to get away with this?" I think again, maybe you're desperate. Eight five five two one two four CBS. All right, let's hit the phones. Bill's in California. Wants to talk about Shohei. Hey, Bill. Hey, how you guys doing? Today and uh, just in case I don't talk to you later, happy Easter week to you guys. Oh, thank you. Same to you. Hope it's a great one. What's your thoughts on Otani? Hey, this this whole Otani thing is it it, it stinks like rotten fish. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, Otani has accountants and all this other stuff, so he knows exactly what's going on with his money, his <laughs> bank account. He knows where things are going. I believe. Whether he he was the ultimate gambler or whatever, but I think him and his buddy there were in cahoots together. Um, and I also think his little his little message he came out with, and unfortunately we can't read him because he has an interpreter saying everything, so we don't we we can't see his body language or his movements. But I I also believe the MBL is kind of hiding behind. 
kid because he's right now the face of Major League Baseball, and Goodell doesn't want to pie in his face, you know. And yeah, bad for I'm sorry, yeah. this, this, I, you know, Parlop, I, I think you're dead wrong. Mm-hmm. I don't think you've been more wrong ever, but this is all on Otani. And as far as I'm concerned, because there's something going on, because I'm a Pete Rose fan, I think he should be in the Hall of Fame. I know he gambled, I get it, I understand. But let's don't forget when this first came out, Pete Rose also said, I did not bet on baseball. And, right. you know, he lied. it's just, and then if you're going to let Otani stay in, then Pete Rose needs to go into the Hall of Fame. Yeah. That's how Bill. I feel. Yep. That's what I know. Bill, that, I, I that, get that's it. That's what's showing. I get it. And, and I know the, the Pete Rose fans and Bill, thank you for the call, are out in full effect. Now, Bill does make a good point about the accountants, right? Like, you know, you're seeing these massive wire transfers that might be unusual activity, especially if you said, hey, like, who's this going to? Um, it, but again, we've seen this happen a lot of times before where famous people get money taken from them by people close to them. Yes, each Yeah, time. I mean, that part is interesting in terms of the accountants because I think one thing we haven't really talked about is Otani was described as this almost, I don't want to say money guru, but when he did that deferment, mm-hmm. there was this idea that it was like, he, it was almost like, oh, he was he's thinking 10 steps ahead. He's thinking, well, if I could avoid these taxes and do this, this, and that, I should get more money on the back end. And we broke down all the stuff about why he would take these deferments and why maybe this was this really shrewd financial move. It is a leap to go from this guy made this incredibly shrewd, bold financial move to he knows nothing about any money being transferred, where the money's coming from, yeah. where it's going. Nobody's contacting him about where the money is going. Like, that is a leap that I, I do find hard to believe. If just a month ago, two months ago, we were like, oh, he's got this whole thing figured out. Well, he's right, telling right. teams it's how little, he's going to deal with his money. It's a little like, oh, and now he's just like la da you know, walking through life. No mm-hmm. idea what's in the bank account. No idea whether the money's coming or going. And maybe it's because the amounts are so big. But even David Sampson, the former president of the Marlins, who joined us earlier, said even for big... Big amounts. You still notice five hundred thousand dollar wire transfers. You still would notice, you know, an accumulation of four and a half million dollars. Or maybe, maybe, maybe somebody knew this was coming down the pike and said, "Let's defer the money." You guys, if you're going to go, he's oh, lying. Wow. I mean, why not get really nefarious here? Because uh, <laughs> kind of Deshaun Watson style. What and how? But how would that help him? I don't know, one. because you can't get... I mean, he's only making $2 million this year. Get suspended for a year, he's going to lose right. $2 million. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. I and mean, that, that is a, that's a move, move his oldest time. I mean, he probably will be put on leave at some point. It's possible. I think so. And at least he's not going to lose any money. I just wonder if he gets suspended because of this, I get the feeling this thing is really unraveled. And you're looking at... Mm. Like, because you said yesterday he was so defi- definitive, not defiant yeah. necessarily, but definitive in how he didn't bet and he didn't he's the victim of this crime you know if it turns out any of this is wrong he's got major issues that might go beyond just a suspension well i mean if he said nothing and let it sort of sit there then he i don't know if mlb has an exemption list like the nfl does the nfl probably would have said hey let's sit until we figure this out mlb might not do that you you have a good point now that he's like laid it out there i am 100 percent innocent any proof of guilt I don't think that proof is coming. I mean, you guys are so certain he's lying. You're telling me in this day and age, like nobody can catch him. Eight five five two one two four CBS. Eight five five two one two four two two seven. You are welcome to weigh in on Otani. You can vote on our poll. Do you believe Otani was telling the truth yesterday? Um, coming up, the NFL makes a big change with one of its rules, and I think this is going to be really annoying and awful for us fans. We'll get to that next, Maggie Pro. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining.
four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Welcome back to Maggie and Perloff. NFL owners meeting still going on. Coaches are talking right now. Uh, Mike McCarthy of the Cowboys is sitting around a table, so it should be interesting news coming out of there because they haven't done anything. But the NFL owners did pass an interesting rule. They are banning the swivel hip drop tackle. Uh, tackle that got a lot of attention last year. Uh, for example, the Ravens' Mark Andrews got hurt on it. It's a tackle where... Usually the defender comes in from the side mm-hmm. and he quote unquote unweights himself when he brings down the guy. So basically you grab him around the waist and you drop your body weight to the ground and bring the runner with you to the ground. And 
a lot of data shows that there are quite severe injuries that come from that. So the NFL is banning that. And I got to be honest, Maggie, the reception <laughs> has not been great by NFL fans that I'm seeing so far on social media. Okay, so this is why it's so beyond frustrating, the NFL and its rule book. It, this is already a problem, and now you're adding multiple layers on top of it. May I just read a quote to you yeah. from Rich McKay from the Atlanta Falcons, who's the chairman of the competition committee, about what just happened yesterday with the banning of this type of tackle. He said, quote, this isn't an elimination of hip drop. This is an elimination of a swivel technique that doesn't get used very often, and when it's used, it's incredibly injurious to ru- to the runner. The runner is purely defenseless. That's well-intentioned, yeah. just like all these rule changes, but can I tell you what I think is going to happen here? Mm-hmm. I think you're asking the referees to make yet an- another judgment call that is really difficult that they don't really have an answer for how in the moment are these refs going to do this. Like, it's one thing if you want to do it after the fact and you want to scroll, comb through the all 22 and you want to send fines to guys like on Tuesday and Wednesday. But in the moment, this is going to be another judgment call that carries with it a 15 yard penalty. And you know what's going to happen is this is either going to stall, is this is going to keep a drive alive for a team, you know, in the fourth quarter on a game winning drive. And I do think that. It's going to make an impact on games. And I think they're going to call it a lot early on to try to send a message or, you know, overemphasize it at first and then sort of, you know, taper it off. Right. But is it any different than horse collar tackle or roughing the pass or other rules that people have issues with that they think are unfair advantages to the offense? Because all those rules came in and they are absolutely unfair advantages to the offense. And it's harder to play defense than ever. And guess what's happening? The NFL gets more popular every year somehow. So I don't think there's any concern. The state, I don't think the league cares. I think they do want this to be safer. They don't want to lose their stars. They're afraid that a quarterback's going to be scrambling and someone's going to swivel hip drop and take him out for the year. Yeah. So I guess it's going to be confusing. It's going to be annoying. The team that gets it called against it, are you going to complain? Uh, we'll all be on Twitter saying that was a terrible call. What are they doing? It's just going to work. It's going to work big picture because all these safety rules are helping the offense, which means more ratings. And at least, you know, the NFL is probably in the right here saying we want to keep the players safer. Yeah. Uh, spare me with the NFL wants to keep the players They safer. want to keep their stars on the field. Uh, okay, well, they also want a 17th game, and they want an 18th game, and they want as much and more and more as yeah. humanly possible. So they want to keep the players safe to a they certain extent. Keep, they, they want to keep their more. quarterbacks on the field. Okay. They want their skill position players on the field. That's the, what this is about. Okay, that and that's fine, but don't hit me with they want to keep the, the players safer like if they did they wouldn't have a 17th game and they're probably going to go to an 18th game if they can and what happens we've got 60 quarterbacks takes a snap takes snaps in during the the course of a league uh, year anyway so i, I don't I'll know if get, this it's stuff is 17th, working i feel like i don't know it's big big deal you're adding a 17th game of and football and it's thursday this is like college football oh and come Europe, on and now they're going come to brazil on. and now and you can't get grass fields why are you like complaining about the, more football all bring players, me more play 20 and play no, every three days i don't care listen that's fine if you want more football but don't tell me the league is doing all these things simply because they care so much about player no. safety when they only want to add games also if they you really, want to keep their quarterbacks on the field that's really, exactly what this is if about. you really cared about keeping players on the field every field would be grass and they won't do that because why? It costs too much money for the owners, and they don't want to do it. So they're doing all these other things that just annoy fans because you're going to, again, have more. It's all going to be about the refs. How often do we talk about the refs? It's so annoying, and it's so, like, you have to be Einstein to figure out the NFL rule book. It shouldn't be this crazy. Yeah, but all these rules of uh, the last 10 years kind of fall into that category, and I mean, is it really, is it ruined the experience? Not at all. Well, this, I, I think, could have a chance of being the type of rule like the defensive pass interference that after that Saints game against the Rams, everyone's up in arms about this, and they do this whole thing about it, and it lasted for a year. Okay, what's the safety rule that's gotten repealed? Well, they might not, but I'm not saying it's not going to be annoying. Yeah, you're right, but it definitely will be annoying and people are going to complain, but generally that's a, the quarterback hits have been ridiculous. I mean, they're totally insane what they're calling a roughing the passer. And guess what? The NFL has 
if anything, double down on those rules. They do not care about the complaints. And the ratings keep going up and up and up. And the offense, actually, the offense took a step back last year, so I'm not surprised they have an anti-defense rule here. This is just the way it is, and it's going to work okay. because it's the NFL. Listen, and I don't want guys out there getting more hurt. I just ask you, do all these rules that are supposed to keep, let's say, quarterbacks a lot healthier, yeah. are they working? Because I'm watching Tyson Bajant play against God knows who and God knows who, and you need three quarterbacks to get through a season anyway. So I, I just would say I think that has more to do with the length of the season, and I think these injuries have more to do with the length of the season than they do this particular swivel hip drop versus another type of illegal tackle. you have da- data on that? I mean, how many quarterbacks? You love third string yeah, yeah. quarterbacks. I got, here's my data. Nathan Peterman's still in the league. There's my data for you right there. I mean, there's w- there's one extra game. Do you really think Nathan Peterman's there because they went from 17 to 16? And also, I don't think Peterman's on a squad right now. Okay. <laughs> I, th- I think it's the frequency with which you play and also the lengthening of the season. Well, the frequency is very no, similar. But I'm saying, like, sometimes, you know, that we talk about this when the schedule comes out, which teams get schedule advantages. Who gets the schedule rest advantage? That's a huge thing, especially in betting and sports media. I mean, it's it's just a fact. Like teams that have more rest between days end up doing better in a game. Why do we think we don't think resting your injuries has anything to do with that? Well, if you're looking at quarterback injuries, uh, no, because I think that it's probably been quite similar throughout the history of the NFL. The rest amount, I don't think it's radically different. Why do people gun so hard for the number one seed in their division to get that bye week? Right, right, but it's always been that way. Has it? I mean, no, there used to be two bye weeks. There used to be uh, two. uh, Both seeds used to get bye weeks. You don't think the rest has anything to do with performance? I think they basically been playing games on Sundays for 80 years. I no, mean, and Wednesdays? And, I, I, excuse me, Thursdays and Mondays and Sundays. Overall, it's just not that. Yeah, I mean, they've been playing Monday well, since Monday 1971. Forever, but they haven't been, been playing, playing it in Germany. I I just don't think that that's such an overall significant difference. That the rest is so different. I mean, obviously, if you want to look at quarterback injuries, quarterbacks are holding onto the ball and trying to make plays more. Tom Brady never got hurt because he got rid of the ball before the guy Tom got Brady to him. Tom Brady devastating knee injury that took him out for a year. But yes, he had unprecedented. He had major health throughout his career. Yeah, because he got rid of the ball. Uh, and you're probably right. One thing, the irony, these roughing the passer rules mean the quarterback should hold on the ball and take more hits. So he does get hurt. But I think the running quarterback trend is obviously affecting the health of the quarterbacks. You can't. I mean, Lamar Jackson, it was kind of a miracle that he stayed healthy last year. That's not been the way it has been. But regardless, yeah, I mean, I think NFL, you can't say that all of a sudden it's a different game than it was in 1985 because you have to play one Thursday night game. No, no, no. Uh, We're talking about the hip drop tackle and other things that are brought into quote unquote. You said you think it's, you know, to make the game safer. And I'm saying, yeah, I, I think the real two things that they're addressing that would make the game safer is not having the season be so long and give grass fields like the players are begging you to do. They won't do that because those things cost money. And those things are the owners don't want to do those things because not having that extra game costs you money and putting in these fields could cost you money. But they'll do the margins here with these with these tr- tackles and different things and put more onus on the referees and make it a worse product to watch because it doesn't cost them a damn thing. Well, in fact, they make money off of it because they find guys. And I know that goes to a charitable thing with the NFL. But the amount of fines from five years ago to now has almost tripled. Right. Ironically, it'll make it a better product because we'll have more touchdowns. And that's all anyone wants to see. There's no way. There's nothing do about you have the- data on that? Are you sure this is going to cause more touchdowns? I would well, well, I assume... By definition, any rule that hurts the defense will help the offense. Well, you just said that it was also, though, that this was one of the most watched NFL seasons, and this also was a season where scoring yeah. was down. But trust me, the trend of more scoring has definitely helped the NFL. It didn't help last year. Yeah, the oh, score has my. been down the last couple it's years. Tr- it, per off, last year. You're telling me all these rules to help the offense haven't helped no, the score? No, I'm, I'm telling oh, what you're oh, saying. Oh, you're talking about in a macro? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, you can't hand, you can't, you know, get guys off the line of scrimmage anymore. This has been a drip, drip, drip. I mean, there's been a lot of rules that have changed. Yeah, this too high safety look is causing some problems, but the offenses will adjust and the officials will adjust, and trust me, the offense will be back. Uh, Andrew Bogus is here with headlines while we talk about NFL rule changes. What else is going on in the world? Well, we've got a gleeful pearl text in the group yesterday when the Spurs ruled out Victor Webinyama for last night's visit from the Suns with an ankle issue. He's on 63 games played, and we're late in the regular season, so the door is slightly ajar for Wemby to not play the required 65 games to win Rookie of the Year. His resume took a further hit when the Spurs upset those Suns without him. So him for three. Oh, my goodness! <laughs> the Globe is good! 
Uh, Bally Sports, San Antonio, short but sweet. Jeremy Sohan, the clinching three in a 104-102 final. He finished with 26 points and 18 boards. Suns head coach Frank Vogel called the loss unacceptable. You give a team like that life, and that's how the NBA works. They get they get going, they get charged up, they start believing they can they, can, they have a chance to win it. And um, credit those guys. They, you know, with Victor out, those guys played really well. What a night for Chet Holmgren. He does nothing, and Wemby takes two hits. So he's got 10, 10 games left. We need him to play two more games. And he's probably going to play tomorrow against yeah. Utah. Sprained ankle is, seems like a load management injury. That's yeah. not real, no. right? What? Least... Sprained ankle is not, a, is not real? Not real enough to sit him for the season. I don't know. Correct. Well, You're grasping well, that for sure. Yeah. But I mean, but a little... I mean, if it was a key game, obviously you could wrap that sucker up and get out there. That's what I'm saying. That, right. There, and will, I, there I just, will be no key games. I, the other thing too the Spurs is, have won you know, 16 all season. Every time you load manage, now you have to make up an excuse. So it could be a sprained ankle might be just kind of fake, right? Everyone's ankles are a little sore at this point of the season. So well, you're still prepping to drive to San Antonio. No, there's, I, I wonder, no, because I don't think it's a real injury. Okay. So I think he'll be back by the next game. Okay. So Perloff's still prepping to make the trip, driving to San Antonio to apologize to Wembenyama. Yeah. For calling a Wembusyama. And when I was in Milwaukee last week, I asked, it is not on the way to San Antonio. So you don't need to Milwaukee. go to Milwaukee. <laughs> yeah. Well, Milwaukee really wasn't on my bingo card. Okay. <laughs> you were going to the Midwest, so you were close. Yeah. I mean, once you're in Chicago, you might as well swoop into Milwaukee. Right. But... Still, wait, I don't know why you guys care. What's the difference how I go? Why did that well, guy bring more... you to that? I have to go the most efficient way? Well, yeah. Bogish wants to go with you. So that's why he was interested in your route. I Originally, thought, yes. I thought you didn't want to go anymore. I don't want to go anymore, no. Now I'm just bothered by your idea that you can go across the country and hook a left in the, somewhere in the middle and get to San Antonio. Yeah, I think waste, waste, technically I think you, you can. Technically you can, which yeah. is not the way I think most people would go. I, you're try, I think you're trying to waste get, get time away from us. That's why I'm yeah. upset. It's 20, it, 29 hours compared to 26 hours. I think everyone will survive. I just there's no way that's true. And I know we, I know <laughs> we keep first, I know we keep doing that Google Maps thing. Yeah. I'm sorry. It just it doesn't compute. I'm with you. That you're only you're only losing three hours. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I was shocked. When I put in the Google Maps, I thought I was gonna get at least five or six hours minimum. But it says three hours difference. I was I as surprised don't, as anybody. I don't know what map you guys are looking at. It's not that far out of the way. Chicago from New York City. <laughs> there you go. From San Antonio. To, to well, Texas. To, the point is you have to go west at some point and you have to go south at some point. So you're going west to Chicago. Right, but but like logic says you should just go southwest the whole time, not west and Well, yeah, south. but you probably wouldn't even do that. You'd probably go down the coast, go south, because you didn't want to hit Charlotte, of course, get some barbecue, say hello to some friends in Atlanta, mm-hmm. come through the Big Easy, get some food. You're not going to go straight. Yeah, you know, what's, what what doesn't make sense is that Chicago to New York alone is a 12-hour drive. So where we're getting this is only you're you're going 12 out of, hours out of your way, right? In its in itself, I, I know what Google Maps is doing when you do the three trips, but it doesn't make sense to me. You're going 12 hours out of your way, but somehow you only lose three hours driving to where you're trying to go. You understand it's not out of your way, right? Well, you have west. to go west anyway, but again, to Bogus's point, you could be going south and west at the same time, and instead of going to the coast and going to Atlanta and Charlotte, you could just be going through Tennessee, and you could really be making good time. Yeah, yeah, but I think you run into the mountains, and I'm not sure the highway system is is set up for that. I, I've never heard of anybody a covered wagon. <laughs> like, like, yeah. the folks who I think you want to go down 95. Here? I've done a lot of road trips. Like you wouldn't just <laughs> cut through. Uh, yeah, that is not a well, direction This is like go, go Washington, D.C., down through Nashville, down through uh, Tennessee, and then continue on to San Antonio. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. You've studied the highway maps? I did for <laughs> when I was looking this up, and I was surprised. <laughs> when to you find... were a hobo. <laughs> <laughs> when I was trekking across the railroad Yeah, no, line. listen. I mean, first of all, too, you got to worry about traffic. I'm going to hit rush hour in Pittsburgh. There's a lot going on here, people. I know, because traffic <laughs> in Chicago, I'm sure, is a breeze. <laughs> Whatever. You want me to go over? Uh, you sending me through. I have no idea no, where. You're sending it... you, in a, as EJ said, the really the the... The, the crux of this problem is that you just want to be on the road as long as possible. That's right. what we're not accounting for. Because you're not trying to be efficient. Yeah, you, you want to just take your time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we should have known that. Yeah. Which the whole point of this is, is you're supposed to be as uncomfortable as possible. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And you're trying to make this comfortable by, I'm going to take a day here. I'm, I'm adding. Eat barbecue here. That's not, <laughs> this is a punishment. I'm adding 7% time to this trip. <laughs> 
You guys are making it sound like I'm visiting Spokane, Washington, and then going out of Vegas, <laughs> betting with Shohei, and then looping around via Mexico to San Antonio. This is a perfectly fine route. You're going to be meeting up with Ipe in Argentina somewhere. <laughs> Where else is no extradition? Um, it's going to be a hell of a ride. Uh, Caitlin Clark scored 32 to drag Iowa into the Sweet 16, 64-54 over West Virginia. Now the Hawkeyes head to Albany to face Colorado this weekend. UCLA took the other spot next to LSU in that corner of the bracket, a 67-63 win over Creighton last night. And Paige Beckers, 32 points, 10 rebounds, 6 assists, and UConn 72-64 win over Syracuse. The Huskies face Duke in the Sweet 16 in Portland on Friday. And on ice last night, the Canucks failed to become the first team to clinch a playoff spot this season, losing at home to the Viking, to the Kings 3-2. L.A. has won four in a row. I am very good at putting typos in there to mess me up on purpose. Guys, back to you. Well, have you heard of our favorite band, Midnight Dexties, Midnight Runners, with their hit song, Come Cl- Come On Clean? <laughs> come Clean. Come, come clean. clean. Or Come On Eileen. I love it. It's all good. Good song. Good song. <laughs> it is a great song. Coming up, thank you, Bogish. Here's a question. What are the Raiders doing at quarterback? We will answer that next. Don't move. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. minutes 30 seconds remaining Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining.
One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. The Defensive Player of the Week is sponsored by the Navy Federal Credit Union, who proudly serves the Armed Forces, DOD, veterans, and their families. Their members are the mission. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. All right, Defensive Player of the Week. Maggie, we got to get it this week. We, we haven't really figured out what EJ is going to pick. We have the tournament. There have been some big defensive plays, some big blocks. I have no idea. <laughs> oh, man. I would say our, our defensive team, Houston. <laughs> scored a hundred point loss, beat someone one hundred and ninety five. Uh, last night there were some key blocks. Someone had a big block in the Iowa game. Yeah, so that was actually the the moment of the game where things were hanging in the balance. It was a tie game with about two minutes left, and now I'm blanking on the young woman's name. She's only five nine, and she blocked a three pointer. Yeah. I mean, they the, go the other way, and, yeah, and the clock was running the, the, yeah. for about that hundredth time. West Virginia couldn't get a shot off before the shot clock ended because they're terrible at offense and still almost beat Iowa. Anyway, yeah, we we I go with the Iowa blocker. I think I should be writing this down in the moment because now we've watched so many games over the last couple of days. I think that it's going to be... Did you go with Zach Eady just because... I mean, three blocks in the game against Utah State... Edie's been a little bit under fire by me because I said before the tournament start that if he doesn't have a good run, his his college career has been a bit of a disappointment. So I wonder if EJ would have picked Zach Edie because we've been talking about him a lot. Hey, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Did they beat Utah State? Only 14 rebounds in the game. Uh, okay. I'm going to go with Edie. Okay, well, first of all, that Iowa blocker is Gabby Marshall. Thank you, uh, Gabby. She, she did not win the Defensive Player of the Week this week. Defensive Player of the Week this week is UConn center Donovan Klingen, mm. who had eight blocks in mm. UConn's win over Northwestern, 75-58. Eight blocks. He also had 14 rebounds in the game. If you're looking at NBA draft prospects, Klingen is probably one of the best left in this tournament. So Klingen... Gets my vote for Defensive Player of the Week, an absolute dominant performance, one of the best defensive performances we've seen all season in college basketball. Don McClingan, your Defensive Player of the Week. All right. Can't get mad at it. UConn has been extremely impressive through the first two rounds, has mo- all of the one seeds. Basically, Houston had to hang on in the last round, but the one seeds have been amazing. I feel like I'm not going to get that bracket right. I don't think Auburn's going to be able to upset UConn here. <laughs> I did <laughs> I did tweet out. I yeah, said I was, I was super nervous about that Yale game with the officials handed to Yale. Um, but uh, Auburn did match up against UConn. You never know. You never know. Like If Auburn survived that game, I think they could have beaten UConn. <laughs> Eternal optimist that you are. Uh, Yeah, if I could do it again, I think UConn looks like the most impressive team. Not a hot take. No, they look really, really good. And we get back to games on Thursday. Uh, Do we have time to get to Antonio Pierce here? Uh, Sure. Let's hear it from Antonio Pierce, the Raiders head coach. Can I have cut 14, please, Pete? He was impressed with J.J. McCarthy. Thinks he's going to go real high. I think he's a very talented group. I mean, we, we interviewed most of those guys at the Combine. Had great conversations with them. J.J. McCarthy, you're talking about a national champion, a winner. So I don't know how he's not in the top three, if you want to be honest. And this is how the J.J. McCarthy odds go skyrocketing, that he could be linked and now is being linked to the commanders at two. Um, Okay. Uh, Pierce, on his own situation at the Raiders, what he likes about Aiden O'Connell and how he could get better. Taking care of the football, managing the game, putting points on the board. I would love to see him become more vocal, right? Is he ever going to become a runner? No, not going to happen. That's okay. 
But there's other ways that you can do that and move around in the pocket. And I think he's done a great job this all season being the building, staying in the Las Vegas area and really working on it. Okay, so the Raiders, obviously, that's not a ringing endorsement for Aiden O'Connell. You know, that's not him saying, man, this is his job. We feel like we can develop him. No, the Raiders at 13 have to be looking quarterback. The question is, will they make a big move to try to go up and get a guy they like? Well, do they really have to? Uh, you know, they, they could say, we're going to wait on it. Because Antonio Pierce, we really believe in him. Uh, they have Gardner Minshew, obviously, who got to 9-7 and seven last year with the Colts. The Minshew O'Connell marriage, I could see them going that way. I don't like it. I would draft Michael Penix in a heartbeat to throw to Devontae Adams downfield. But they, they're probably looking at last year saying, you know what? Minshew is good enough to win an Indy. They did not have a wildly talented team. We have a little more talent maybe on defense with Max Crosby. Maybe we can win 10 games with this guy. Okay, it's possible. But so, so then what's the plan, though? Because Gardner Minshew is not your plan. That's your Band-Aid. This is the Raiders. Well, I know, but at some point they have to get a quarterback. Yeah, I mean, I, I would draft, again, I would draft a quarterback, but I think the fact that they have Minshew and O'Connell, they might say O'Connell's a developmental guy, Minshew's a veteran. They might. Then you're basically telling your fan base, we're mailing it in this year. We have no shot of beating the Chiefs. Well, we're you could get to the playoffs with Gardner Minshew. Big if. Big if in the AFC. You'd be in a big quarterback deficit when you're looking at some of the other arms in that conference. Coming up, the latest with J.J. McCarthy. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. minutes 30 seconds remaining Two minutes remaining.
One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. He's the reigning Fortnite champion. She's a Call of Duty legend. They are Maggie and Perloff on CBS Sports Radio. Yeah, it looks like the Dallas Cowboys are more uh, wait and see than all in. <laughs> Maggie and Perloff, welcome to the show. So you got Mike McCarthy and, of course, all the other uh, coaches, owners at the ownership meetings down in Orlando. And obviously the Dallas Cowboys are always interesting, particularly this offseason because they've been not doing anything. Well, it started out with Jerry Jones saying all in. Mm -hmm. And then that meant they added linebacker Eric Kendricks, basically a veteran minimum kind of deal. Uh, They re-signed their long snapper. All in. Important. Yes. Really uh, important thing. Uh, they recited a couple guys. Oh, oh, yeah. They lost about 11 contributing players that basically signed for next to nothing elsewhere and doesn't make any sense to anybody. But effectively, the Cowboys have sent the message, we are not a serious Super Bowl contender anymore. Maybe that's the best thing to come out of this because I can't see the way this offseason has gone. No one's picking the Cowboys to go to the Super Bowl next year because they couldn't do it this year. Uh, they, everything was set up for them. The NFC seemed kind of down. And the Cowboys were really good in the regular season, could do nothing in the playoffs. There is no reason to think any of that's going to change because of the way this offseason has come in. What, is it all in? Is it the exact opposite of what happened? Well, it's all out or Jerry, just we're good. Jerry Jones did change. He kind of flipped that yesterday. He didn't say this on camera. He said it to a reporter, uh, I believe for Dallas Morning News, uh, that he said, we're going to have to do more with less now. It's like, man, maybe somebody's got to take the microphone away from Jer. This is like when we take the car keys away from grandpa and grandma after it gets, uh, you don't want them driving because how do you go from all in to do more with less? Like that to me is such, I know Jerry Jones at times has been a mastermind of messaging. This is not one of those times. (laughs) Jerry Jones has said contradictory things at 82, 62, 42, 22. I don't think this has anything to do with age. It's not like Jerry has been a model of consistency with his quotes. The guy speaks off the top of his head all the time. But here's the reality. They have a huge contract with Dak Prescott, and they're not redoing it, so they're not going to create any salary cap space that wise. $4 million means nothing. They have to pay C.D. Lamb. They have to pay Micah Parsons. The bill is due, and there's nothing they could do. The reality of the situation is they are stuck and I think the other reality is they are not going to take a step up. There's how are they going to become the Super Bowl team with the, basically running the same back group, running the same group back, just a little bit watered down. Well, if you ask Mike McCarthy, we'll get back into Dak in a minute. But if you ask Mike McCarthy, he said fans do not worry about the inactivity of the team during free agency. We are definitely improving. You know, we're just. We're just not part of the uh, free agent market right now. So is that what Cowboys fans can hang their hat on, the fact that there are guys coming back that are going to be getting better because people keep waiting for the Cowboys to make moves? Well, I think that, and also, it's, I mean, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot left. So, I mean, it's, 
you know, you'll probably have a market right before the draft or post draft, and then you got your June first market, and you know, obviously we'll have another draft class. So, I have great confidence in our roster. All right, that is courtesy of ESPN. Of course, you heard Adam Schefter there asking some questions. And so, uh, well, sure. Yes, you have all these things. You have a market before the draft, okay? You got the draft, you got the post draft, and then you got the June 1 designation. I think Cowboy fans are coming to grips with this, which is yeah. you're going to have your draft, which by the way, we praise the Cowboys because they do draft well, but they're also just like every other yeah. team where there's hits and there's misses. For every CeeDee Lamb and Micah Parsons, do we know what Mazzie Smith, by the way, is now they announced going to get shoulder surgery today? And other guys who, like, yeah. th this is the thing. You're just like every other team. You're not going to hit 100%. And now you're asking your front office, essentially, to be perfect, almost perfect in a draft to fill holes that you need. Yeah, I mean, actually, I think they are a little better at drafting. Uh, Mazzy Smith already had the uh, shoulder surgery. He oh, said he he's recovering it. well. Oh, good. And their second pick last year, Luke Schoonmacher, who's pretty good, the tight end, he had shoulder surgery as well. And everyone knows this guy we loved at last year's draft, DeMarvion Overshone, got hurt really early in the season ACL. So their draft picks are not coming to the... The irony is they're definitely not coming to the rescue here. They are. They have been a good kind of conservative line-building draft thing. But you, you let Tyron Smith out of the building... And I know he's been hurt, but that's going to affect the team. A guy like that, uh, yeah, I, I just, I'm not quite sure. The one thing, they do get Diggs back, yep. who was hurt last year. I, I just think that they're, they, we know the ceiling of the Cowboys, even when they're fully loaded. And this really should have been an all-in season. They should have extended Dak. I know that's an unpopular, should have extended him to free up salary cap moves. They should have extended him And then get a bunch year, of guys in there. To be honest, they should have done it last year. Not even wait till this year, because... If you had just gotten it done last season when we first started talking about this, right. you would already have this thing set. And even if you did end up drafting a quarterback or something in the second round or third round, it, the timeline of that might line up a little bit better with the ending of Dak's contract. Like, let's, he might. Well, they'd be two years into a five year deal. Would that be a big difference? I think so, as opposed to if they end up extending him after the season, then you're well, that's... one year into a five year deal. That's so well. If if they don't extend him before the season, he they can't bring him back. That'd be total franchise malpractice, okay, right? So then you're be, looking at probably taking a quarterback in the draft then this year, right? Maybe not the first round. Maybe probably second not the first round. round. Maybe in the second round. Yeah, okay. which is a, a flyer. Sure, but again, because you failed to do anything in free agency and a lot of your depth walked out the door. That second round pick is now, they're already valuable. No. That's now more valuable for maybe somebody on the offensive line, maybe a linebacker. Yeah, maybe. maybe you want to get a go running back there. I mean, you're going to spend it on a quarterback that you know is not going to see the field because you've got Dak and you've got Cooper Rush. Well, yeah. It, and Trey Lance, I you guess. You know what? You convinced me. Don't draft a quarterback because if they're not going Dak next year, they want to. Th Jerry's not a young man. He's got to bring in an Aaron Rodgers type. He's got to go all in at quarterback. Who's that next guy? There's got to be another guy. You know, it could be. Either you, uh, Kirk Russell Cousins Wilson. has guy, got a place. Russell Wilson. Of, oh every boy. year, every year now, one or two big veterans come free, okay, and somebody's going to want to play in Dallas. Somebody's going to want to get rid of a contract. They, they could get a big name in. Okay, but you get a big name. That's not all equal, you know. Because if you're a big name, most likely you're a franchise quarterback with your team. You're not getting Lamar. You're not getting Joe Burrow. Yeah, but you might get Aaron Rodgers. You might get Kirk Cousins. You might get Tom Brady. Just some of the names that have moved in the 2020s. No, you but you, you can't get Rodgers or Kirk Cousins. Well, there's the next Rodgers or Kirk oh, Cousins. Okay. I'm saying every offseason now, a big veteran has come loose. Yeah, and somebody's going to want to play in Dallas. Probably could get Deshaun for a song if you wanted him. Good luck with that. I mean, he's been an abject disappointment. Uh, I, I understand, but I'm just saying there's definitely going to be quarterback movement. Every year now, some older guy comes, comes free. And the other thing, too, is... Maybe they can convince Dion to uh, let Shador come to Dallas again. I don't know. There's a lot of options. Dion. There's a lot of options. Yeah. They're not going to have. I, I, they're not going to have a ton of salary cap space next year either. But well, I don't even know how we got on this. Like, what, are, what are the Cowboys going to do at quarterback? I mean, it's a major question. Uh, Jalen Hurts too could could shake free for sure. You're trying to kick him out of the building. Uh, In I mean, Philadelphia. This is Philadelphia. They kicked Carson Wentz out of the building. I There are so many different things that could happen by next year. Yeah, but is that a plan? See, like, that's the problem. And I think that's where the Dallas Cowboy fans, I think, would be really frustrated because this is a problem you brought on yourself yeah. because you didn't approach the Stack Prescott um, negotiation in the right way. 
And now you're hoping a prayer that Jalen Hurts shakes free or you're hoping a prayer what Daniel Jones. I mean, who do you want this Jared Goff? Who's going to be the and I don't think Goff's actually going to become a free or uh, be available. You want to do I a mean, spin look at with it. Derek Carr? Listen, it's, like it's you could have gotten Justin Fields for a song this year. I think most Cowboys fans are sick of Dak and they would rather start over. But they didn't get Fields. See, that's the thing. They could have done that yeah. too. They traded what a third or fourth rounder for Trey Lance. What was it? A third or fourth, fourth rounder? And, yeah, Trey Lance. Didn't want to do a future sixth round of future fifth, a uh, sixth round that could become a fourth rounder for Justin Fields. Like they could have done this stuff. They did Ooh, nothing. I got one. How about Matthew Stafford coming home? I mean, how, and what's the state of his spine? When I'm he's just saying, in? I'm, yeah, I'm just saying there are always options. I, I'll bet you if we put a poll up, give name all those names I just said, would you rather take a risk with those guys or keep Dak for the next five years? Most Cowboys fans are done with Dak. Will you admit that? Yeah, I think they are, but again, that it it doesn't help you even if you are done with them because you don't have an obvious answer here. You know, unless you really want the next Baker Mayfield is more likely than the next I was about Tom to say, Brady. The Bucks are gonna be pretty sick of Baker's contract by next <laughs> season. Derek Carr is definitely gonna wear out as welcome. It's there's gonna be tons of options next year. A good option. All those guys have good games. <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the true. way, you're right. I can't fight you on that one. They do have good games sometimes. But you have to admit, though, there is way more veteran turnover than there used to be. Every offseason, somebody, somebody big name comes okay, loose. And Lamar you. Jackson was out there last year, too. Well, yeah, but that was he really? I mean, it would have cost question. a lot to get him. So here's my question, though. Yeah. If you're going to go that, we're talking about Dak Prescott and the Cowboys in, in the future with him at the position. If you're going to go for a Derek Carr or you're going to go for a Baker Mayfield, isn't Dak basically better? Well, I don't Isn't know. Isn't he, he not basically, he yeah. is better than those guys. So you didn't upgrade yourself. What about A.A. Ron and uh, Mr. Rogers? It feels like he's a natural fit with Jerry Jones and Dallas to me. <laughs> yeah. He's definitely not going to be a Jet next year. I'll tell you that much right now. I, is he going to make it through a whole Jet season this year? Can we get? Can we start with the baby steps on this before I'm we start saying, putting Rodgers on the third team? I think there are a lot of Cowboys fans who want to rip the Band-Aid and start over a quarterback, whether it's draft, whether it's free agency, whether it's something different. So I think... In many ways, their decision not to extend Dak and create salary cap room is defensible. I, I think a lot of fans would cho- go that route, say, you know what? This season might not be ideal because we couldn't bring in a lot of help, but maybe maybe we don't extend Dak. There is logic there. It's not like okay. when you say there's no plan, I mean, extending Dak for five years is a risky proponent too because he hasn't gotten them to the Super Bowl. Sure. I mean, I get it. I, I just think that say you put together another 10 to 12 win season. Yeah. There's an expectation that your window is still open. So to then go into a season with an unsure quarterback situation, ask Pittsburgh Steelers fans how it feels. I mean, it might be an upgrade for the Steelers oh, now. But, God, they're stoked. But Russell Wilson and Justin Fields are— Yeah, they're are, thrilled about that compared to Kenny Pickett. Okay, but again, I'm not comparing them to Kenny Pickett. I'm comparing them to Dak, who's been winning you double-digit games for a decade now. Uh, and, that's, I don't think they're—I think Steelers fans— <laughs> And, and by the way, the are very about similar Pittsburgh, Cowboys fans. Think about Pittsburgh. I might think it would work, but there's a very non-zero chance that both Russ is out of gas and that there isn't more meat on the bone for Justin Fields because his market told the story. Now, I think he could have a resurrection here and he could still salvage his career, but my opinion differs from basically, I don't know, the league. So I'm will I would be willing to admit if I was the one who's wrong here, considering he got traded for a bag of footballs in 2025. So I, I don't know if Pittsburgh Steelers fans are feeling great about that. And again, that we're talking about the Cowboys, you gotta worry a little a little bit about the grass isn't always greener here. You might not like Dak, but what's waiting for you on the other side? I think most Cowboy fans, and we could even do a poll, most Cowboy fans want to find out. I mean, really, I, I like Dak, and I wasn't surprised he had such a good season. He shreds the Eagles every time he plays them. Mm-hmm. But I do think his playoff failures are now a real thing. And part of it is the team around him. I agree with that. But they, they are in desperate need of a rebuild, in a yeah. sense. They need to reset their table. And honestly, the best way to do it is a new quarterback. And I think they can get a big, big old guy to come in if they want. Uh, say a Stafford. Say, say I honestly think if they want Aaron Rodgers, Rodgers is not going to spend any more time in New York. Why not bring him in? Why not do something? Get Tom Brady out of retirement. You've been calling for that for years. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to let that one finally die. <laughs> I'm finally going to let oh. that one go. 
I don't think he's coming back, guys. Kyler Murray back to Dallas. Why not? I mean, there's going to be there's a lot yes. of movement these days in quarterback. I just think this, Kyler Murray's had so much playoff success. That being said, yeah, I just I'm think that the Cowboys a, want to try something different. I, I just think that a lot of fans want a new path. This year, they're stuck in a weird limbo. I mean, is anyone, we started, the, I think you mentioned this, is anyone picking them to go to the Super Bowl next year? I can't imagine people doing that. No, maybe, and maybe this will be the year no one sees them coming. <laughs> the Dallas Cowboys a little hard, but uh, we'll see. Yeah, I don't know if the Cowboys are going to sneak up on anybody. <laughs> it's kind of hard. It's the smell of Johnny Walker coming from the Jerry bus that really <laughs> gives it away. 855-212-4CBS, 855-212-4227. We've got breaking news coming up on the other side. Another rule in the NFL gets unanimously agreed upon or just agreed upon. I think it's always unanimous. It's not, not unanimous. <laughs> not unanimous. Right? Oh, but it's agreed but definitely, upon. Definitely, but it is passed. I'll bet you right now, Mark Davis voted against it. Whatever it is, I don't know the rule. <laughs> you don't even know the rule. You just know Mark Davis. Oh, was he loves voting against everyone else. It's <laughs> like seeing his name in the news. Eight five five two one two four CBS. You're in a five minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remain. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One 
one minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Welcome back to Maggie and Perloff. I don't understand why people, Maggie, complain about the NFL rule book. It's very, very clear and simple. <laughs> yeah, sure. And they're making it simpler by the day. They ban the swivel, hip, drop, tackle. I mean, everybody can see those from a mile away. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes, is it just a hip drop or a swivel hip drop? But I think in the break, you were complaining they passed the new kickoff return. Huzzah, huzzah. And it's totally, this is easy. This is how we, me and my friends always do it. We always hear basically the kicker. Kicks from 35 as always. Nothing changing there. And, you know, nine members of the return team line up in the setup zone. We all know the setup zone. Been there when I was a single man between the 35 and 30 line. <laughs> yeah. and two retire- life there. And two returners, of course, are in the landing zone. I mean, everyone knows the landing zone. Between Didn't make the, goal the landing line. so much for yeah. you, but the setup uh, zone you were in. <laughs> so you have a landing zone and a setup zone, and you have various kinds of fair catches. And now God knows what's going to happen to the onside kick. I know that basically you have to tell the officials you're going to have an onside kick, although I think that rule uh, might be worked on in the future. So I just gave you the gist of it, but yeah. this is this is an XFL rule from 20 uh, and 2023, and then the XFL and, and USFL merged and got rid of this rule because it was so silly. But the NFL <laughs> said, you know what? We'll take a we, turn. we like it. Uh, this is a very radical movie. This is one of the most radical rule changes I've ever seen. Yes, as far as like how different the game is going to look, this is going to look very different. This because play. This play, yeah. the kickoffs, because they want more kickoffs. This is the, the the league that wants safety, wants more kickoffs. But uh, And I'm obviously being sarcastic there. So it, it's my understanding. You just set that up correctly. So essentially, picture this in your mind. You're going to have the receiving, te- the kicking team and the receiving team five yards apart from each other, essentially right. lined like a- up across from each other, like Red Rover, Red Rover style Five yards apart on the 35 and the 30. Close, almost like a normal play. The 40 and 35, I'm sorry. It's closer to a normal play. So basically, they're not running down the field at full speed each other. They're almost like it's a line of scrimmage. Exactly. So like everyone, so then the ball gets kicked off and everybody runs in the same direction once it's field in either the setup zone or whatever. The setup zone, uh, I'm sorry, the landing zone is the team's 20-yard line to the goal line. I guess... Yeah, I just like the red zone. Okay, so whatever. Uh, The landing zone is from the goal line to the 20. The setup zone is from the 35 to 35 to the 40. And then there's like a kickoff start line. So what I'm to believe here, we're talking about the new kickoff rules that just were passed moments ago at the NFL owners meetings. No fair catches. No such thing as a fair catch anymore. And I think that's going to throw people off. Now, there's three different types of touchbacks. Right that I'm seeing here. You can get a touchback to the 40, a touchback to the 30, and a touchback to the 20 for various different things. But I, it is my understanding there is no fair catching Right, but for, for most of the NFL history, there were no fair catches on kickoffs anyway. I'm just saying, this is going to seem, this is going to feel different than what we've seen over the last few years. Right, I, actually, there, yeah, I mean, you don't, kickoffs are not. You don't generally not, fair catch, right? Yeah, there's no reason to fair catch or kickoff in most. So that that's it's not a big issue to right? me. Um, the one thing I did read, and I'm sorry, I have to update this stat. The XFL did not, it's hard to break one out of this, uh, format. It's closer to a running play. Uh, so it's not going to be like all of a sudden we're going to see a bunch of 85 yard runs. Uh, I do understand it because we all know just the general, (laughs) the general thing of, uh, guys flying down the field and picking up full speed and the other team picking up full speed. It is quite a dangerous play, but uh, last year, there were only 21% of kicks were returned. In mm. the Super Bowl, none were returned, ironically. I was going to make that bet and forgot to at the last minute. So 
they had to do something to make this play. Otherwise, just put it at the 30-yard line and start there. I think that's the other option. Which do you think is smarter, this really kind of confusing rule, which might be fun for kids, or should they just go straight to a touchback the offense starts at the 25? Well, here's the thing, though. Don't we have data about um, drives that start at the 25 and the percentage that they end in points versus drives that start inside the year 10? Like, if if the drive starts right. inside the 10-yard line as opposed to starting the drive at the 25. Right, but at a kickoff, you're unlikely to start inside your 10. Right, right. You would be, but, I mean... It's, it's, most guys just boot it right out of bounds, right? I mean, that's yeah. Most I mean, it. that's what we had basically last year was. Uh, but there's other. I don't know. Starting at the twenty five, I feel like is giving your your opponent some good field position. This has a chance to to break, maybe break off a couple more, maybe a more exciting play. But were we just talking about the hip drop tackle and the swivel tackles yeah. and how dangerous those are? Couldn't you see this maybe being also? I know it's not two guys running straight into each other. But at the same time, couldn't you see more dangerous tackles yeah. being made on this play as well? Well, I mean, just... If you want they, to make it safer, do the touchback thing. Automatic. Uh, right, right. That that would be the ultimate safety rule. But it's, I think it's closer to a regular play. So you have the same injury rate or a similar injury rate to a normal run play. Sure. So that's the thinking. Uh, I understand. The kickoff as it was was stupid. I mean, remember in the Super Bowl, there, not only was there not a return, it was kind of nerve-wracking. Especially, yeah, if you're like the Cowboys in the playoffs last year and they do try to maximize every play. Right, right. And but, the kickoffs were not fun. But like it's nothing. funny, though. You you pointed out earlier the sort of the hypocrisy of the NFL that they're saying this is for safety, um, and it really isn't uh, about the hip drop tackle. They're saying this is for safety, but it obviously isn't because there's going to be way more tackles. Yeah, they want more action. So yeah, anytime yeah. there's more action, I don't think it's going to be more safe. But they're saying this is a safety play because you're getting rid of the guys flying down the field. You know, uh, they, they had gotten rid of the wedge, which yeah. seemed crazy now that we think about it. Do you know at the turn of the century uh, that people were dying all over football fields because they had these swinging wedges where basically both teams would line up and just run at each other at full speed. Then Teddy Roosevelt got involved and this is when Yale was a powerhouse back in 1903. So the, the NFL is a long, long history of making things safer uh, sometimes they have unforeseen consequences. I think it's going to be fun. I'm for this. Why not? I mean, I, I still, it's going to take a while to get used to the landing zone. And <laughs> I feel like a, a weirdo saying, yeah, oh, right. was the he really in the, the landing, landing zone? zone? The setup zone and the landing zone sound like unserious things. Do you remember, didn't NBC, did they try to do something about the green zone on their broadcast? Like, we uh, all know what the well, red zone is. Well, that's what Tom, Cur- yeah, Tom Coffey Tom, Tom Coffey so calls Coffey's the red zone the green zone. It's yeah. so stupid. And the green zone's what, the 20 to 30? No, it's, it's, the, red it's the red zone. Because you make your money in the green. Yeah. No, yeah. no, 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 no. I think NBC did something where it was beyond yeah, the yeah. 20. Yeah, yeah. They, I think I, I, that does sound really familiar. Yeah. And I was like, I don't, this is like trying to make fetch a thing. Like, I don't think it's going to catch on. This is like what when the XFL started with He Hate Me, didn't they do like jump ball or a scrum in the middle of the field? To start the game. Yes. Yeah. It was like a steal there, the bacon. Yeah. Yeah. This feels a little bit like that. I mean, <laughs> that you're borrowing from the XFL and the XFL is like, this is so stupid. They got rid of it. The <laughs> fact that the XFL didn't even want it anymore. And now the NFL is taking it. It is unusual. This is this is unexpected. Yeah, Those, the XFL's like, uh, ah, we're good. Here yeah, comes the NFL, we'll take it. It seems a little radical to me. I I'm very. I mean, who? I usually leave, go get a sandwich, or go to the <laughs> fridge for the kickoff. Now I'm gonna watch. I'm like. Dude, he's in the safety zone. It just looks so weird, too. The kicker yeah. by himself, the ball's yeah. in the air, the 20 blockers are standing there still waiting for the returner to catch it, and then they move. Right. It's so bizarre. And looking. they have to figure out the onside kick because I read the rule that they have to tell the officials we're going to onside kick. Then they go back to the old style. Right. Oh, really? So there's no surprise onside kick. Because you can't line it. You can't load up on either side. No. It's right. a pot. You actually... Uh, yeah, I don't know what the rule is. You can't onside kick in this format. I, yeah, well, the, the rule, I think the one they were discussing, and I guess we'll learn more details, was they would allow you to at least move one guy over. So you can't load up the way you used to, but before it had to be basically just an a even line. Yeah, right? it was five and five. Now right. it could be now, six and four. Now you could do six and four, which is a little helpful for the onside kick. That also kind of got neutered completely. Yep. But... But yeah, that that is going to be an interesting thing because there is oh. no onside in terms of surprises. I also think there's a there's a I think there's a restriction also on when you can do it. Yep, like, only fourth quarter. Right, which that's the part uh, I Payton, really dislike. Take that. And you have to be trailing. Yeah, it's only I, a means I, to catch up now. That's the part that I think is. I love everything else about it. That's the only part about this I don't like. But and multiple teams have tried to uh, impose a fourth and twenty-five rule, where you have a twenty, right. you can, or fourth and twenty instead of the kick, you can try a long pass play, which I think eventually will get passed. 
Man, that that is a shot of Sean Payton because that is one of the all-time great plays in Super Bowl history is him starting the third quarter with the onside kick. To to say you have to only do it in the fourth quarter, I don't like that. It, kinda, mean, it's, it basically I, only happens in the fourth quarter anyway. It's a very rare example. And I think there are games where people do it, obviously. They do the surprise onside kicks, and we see that to start a second half or whatever. But I also think there are games where you say, hey, look, I'm playing against a team. My defense is awful. And the only way we're going to win this game is if we get the ball back right now in the third quarter. You should be allowed to do that. Like, the way the fact they're legislating that is ridiculous. It's yeah. stupid. It's anti-strategy. I, I, I don't I don't, I don't love it. We'll, we'll see about the kickoffs. This could be fun. Bogus is here with headlines. How are you? I'm doing well, guys. Uh, Baseball is not alone dealing with gambling drama right now. As you've already discussed this morning, Raptors forward Jonte Porter reportedly under investigation because of betting irregularities involving two of his recent games. On both occasions, Porter made early exits so that the under hit on all his prop bets, and there were plenty of bets placed on those unders. Porter was officially out for personal reasons last night as the Raptors lost at home to the Nets, 96-88. By the way, shouldn't they have to, like, rescind that? Like, we know it wasn't personal reasons. <laughs> yeah, the personal reasons. They do that stuff all the time. Um, and, like, when under the investigation. Guys, yeah, and then yeah. we learn, oh, they're under investigation. You should say, oh, no, actually he's sad because he's under investigation. I bet the PA has nothing to do with that. But, yes, I, you should probably change the designation. Personal reasons, it feels like a, a bastardization of personal reasons. Right, exactly, because personal reasons can be very serious, and yeah. we take it very serious. This guy is, is, is sitting, <laughs> sitting because he may have been gambling on basketball. I mean, come on. The only thing I don't know, it, was he technically unable to play last night, or could can he play while under investigation? I'd like, he's not, not a suspended. Good idea. <laughs> I, think I think he could have played. Right. No, at, I'm not saying he should have. Yeah. Right. But if he could have played, if he's not suspended on what, what is, you know, the exempt list or whatever, like, he that he's not playing for personal reasons. The personal reasons are he might have bet on basketball games. <laughs> it's a wide like, definition of personal reasons. That it's him is saying, hey, I can't play because of something yeah. that's My happened to me. My dad's sick or whatever. Right. Whereas yeah. clearly the Raptors or the NBA has been like, sit down, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all of a sudden, the Clippers cannot win at home. Five straight losses in L.A., 133-116 to the Pacers last night. Who are these guys, Ty Lue? Yeah, we have an identity, but right now our identity has, has been shaken because we're not winning. You know, we're not doing things the right way um, consistently. And so when you don't do that, you're going to lose. You know, you're going to lose games. Games you should probably win. His team currently loses a tie for fourth out west with the Pelicans. The Kings and Mavericks, meanwhile, remain tied for six, both winning last night. Sacramento 108-96 over the Sixers. DeMontis Sabonis, 11 points, 10 boards, 13 assists to become the fifth player ever with 25 triple doubles in a season. Dallas won in Utah, 115-105 behind 29-12 and 13 from Luka. The Rocket winning streak is 9 after downing Portland 110-92. And the Knicks stumped Pearl's Pistons 124-99. Somebody wasn't in MSG last night. Dante DiVincenzo scoring a career-high 40, hitting a team record 11 threes. I have a greater joy knowing that the Pearl's Pistons got crushed by the Knicks and his new head coach is making excuses, complaining about the Knicks running out the score. I, I loved it. Feels on brand for Tom Thibodeau to be a big regular season winner here. At least we win something. Look at your Pistons and Sixers. Not winning much lately, are they? Uh, well, we'll all be sitting at home watching the Eastern Conference Finals together. <laughs> okay, well, okay, Mister. Okay, Mister. There are no there are degrees of loser. Oh, Whatever. Yeah. Bilotti thinks they're all losers except for the the Nuggets. They are. Uh, <laughs> Very specifically. By the way, even I, I'm fans of two of those three teams, and I do think we're all By losers. Sitting home in the Eastern Conference Finals. Okay, we'll clip that. Uh, it's probably the, happening. I, I'm a Knicks fan, too. It's probably happening. I'm going to actually make my own rule proposal that if the Knicks do actually make it to the Eastern Conference Finals, both EJ and Pete both have to sit home. <laughs> we won't be yeah. able to stand you guys. Yeah, there's You've a, been waiting a long time, yeah, though, so yeah, we'll yeah, let yeah, you have yeah. it. Knicks I mean, are a tough fan base to see them win. Even Knicks fans might admit that. <laughs> <laughs> no, they won't. No, they won definitely the, not. They won in the 70s. Yeah, <laughs> it's not like they won last year. Uh, no, but EJ, you and all your cronies yesterday are like, oh... 
a, a, a drama free Knicks win. I could get used to these. These are great. I said it was good, for, I said no it was good for your health. It is. I saw like eight tweets about that last night. Rapid fire. We well, get it, guys. You're beating the Pistons they, by 25. They are Congrats. The real, they are the real basketball team in New York. So Listen, you're not a Knicks fan. All right. Enough hey, of that. Oh. I'll give you the Jets, the Mets, the Islanders. Do not start telling me about oh, the Knicks oh, right wait now. Wait a minute. Wait, is that what, true? Bilotti, fake fan? What is, what is this fan anger wagon? for toward me? I'm not yeah. anger. I'm just this grasp of reality. So he, he, he calls one Nets game and all of a sudden. I'm not asking to I thought he's Jason Kidd. Just I'm, because your Nets are in 14th place, I mean, <laughs> that doesn't, I think it's doesn't, 11th. Um, <laughs> you made two historical statements this morning. You said what? I'm an, I've had enough anger for now. I'm taking a break, and I'm a Knicks fan. I'm mm. a Knicks fan since when? Lunch. Um, 1995. No. When well, I was a little kid. We, we found out from Bilotti he was done with the NBA. Well, I, well in general, I'm done with the yeah. NBA. Gotcha. I am a Knicks fan. Do you yeah. have a Knicks pullover? I do. Yeah. Damn it. Ah, uh, got him. All right. Fine. With the old logo as well. There right. you go. EJ's much. I mean, this is Pio, maybe EJ's a different oh, kind yeah. of fan. EJ, EJ is uh, like I am with the Mets. He is with the Knicks. I watched that terrible Pistons game last night. <laughs> right. so I, I, I had no chance I'm watching that game last night. No, come on. The women were playing last night. Had to watch UConn. Had to watch Iowa. No. I sat there Blues. watching that game last night, and I'm thinking... Huh, the rest of the show is probably watching Iowa right now. I watch <laughs> <laughs> Not probably. And, 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 <laughs> were you really watching the Knicks game, EJ? Were you? This so is I an would, honest place. Th- no, yeah, I'm not, I was about to go there. There was three things on my TV, and being honest, none of them were Iowa. Knicks first. No, WWE Raw first. There it is. Knicks, then Bachelor. Okay, except for you're lying about two or three Shohei Otani style. Come on, you you knew every <laughs> detail of the Bachelor. We knew every detail of the Bachelor this morning. I every second it, yeah, you broke I watched, down. It, I watched it after the Knicks game. Which is kind of sports in a way, too. Bachelor's yeah, com- I, I competition. Don't, I, there's, I have no shame in being a super fan of The Bachelor. It's kind of sports. Yeah, it's what, totally. The, the, there's the, a the lot. The rabid making the out. Bachelor, <laughs> the Bachelor's like wrestling. That's burning. what I say. I think it's more like wrestling. Jesse Palmer is the host. He's a former quarterback. There's that, too. There's a lot of the Bachelor was a tennis pro. Yes, he's a, he's a really good tennis player. He's a, there's coach. a lot of he's a really good tennis yeah, player. And the a lot success of guests rate is like a 1980s shortstop in the National League hitting like 188. I know that's those the relationships problem. don't. Work. <laughs> Rafael Santana rule. Yeah, they're Rafael Santana good at making couples. Uh, EJ was upset. But my wife gave a huge thumbs down to the new Bachelorette Jen, which is fantastic. Uh, I don't know oh why you give a thumbs down. It's fan- she's, a, oh. she's a beautiful woman. She's smart. She's, you know, it's it's, it's awesome. It's should have been, you know, it should have been Maria. You no, know, it's Maria <laughs> is a hot mess. Okay, yeah, put her, been Maria. which is why you put her in Bachelor in Paradise. Okay, again, yeah, I know I, that. I'm a fan of this. Put her in Bachelor in Paradise. Put her where all these other hot people who are hot messes, and let her hot run the sh- island. Because that's what's gonna happen. You said her name Jen, like she's making it up. Jen. Well, the funny <laughs> is thing was, her name really <laughs> Alyssa? Who's name Jen now? I came up. Jen? I came upstairs to the bedroom after the Iowa game. My wife's watching The Bachelor, and she goes, "I gotta watch this to the end because they're gonna name the next Bachelorette. It's gonna either be, uh, was it Kelsey or Kelsey versus or Maria? No, well, no, it was Kelsey. Oh, yeah, it was Kelsey versus Maria. So she's like, like Aiden, I don't. Jaden, Jaden, and Braden, yeah, yeah. whatever <laughs> she, version. Of she that she is. didn't know who it was gonna be. Everyone thinks it's these two people, and then the person announced. She goes, and the next Bachelorette is Jen. <laughs> and my wife goes, "Who's Jen?" <laughs> No, I'll be honest. I got spoiled on Twitter, and I saw it. I, saw it. I can't wait to see Jen the Bachelorette next season. I was like, who's Jen again? Yeah, Jen is such an anonymous name. Everyone's like, is it going to be Kelsey or Maria? It's Jen. But she came out. Which Jen? She There's came seven out, Jens looked, last season. She came out. She looked great. She's the first Asian Bachelorette, so that's cool. Like, I, 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 am, I am pro- Jen, I know there's. I just can't believe you guys still have stamina for this stuff. Oh, it's awesome! It's it's, well, you, it's not. It's all the same. Love no, is blind is taking a lot the of the energy away because love is blind is probably the second most popular thing in America behind the NFL right now. I watch that, I watch that too. <laughs> I'm, I'm super fan of that as well. Yeah, yeah, of course you are. Yeah, it's close. It it's not a TV. It's close to sports. It's sports adjacent. Would you at least give me us that? Because she's guess they're guessing what each other look like. Uh, well, there's a sporting event every year. <laughs> so la- this year it was tennis, and usually they do a football game every year. During the show. No, no, it's not. Sports. The Bachelor Bowl. Oh. Yeah, that's, it's, there's better tennis playing at a tampon commercial. There's a, they, they play Rich. football every year. <laughs> it's wow. a line from Bridesmaids, guys. <laughs> oh, there is. It's true. 
<laughs> yeah, anyway, I, was, well, I was watching a million dollar listing watching old rich people try to buy homes. I don't oh, know. That show's that. not for me. I'm down with that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, those shows are great. It's actually, there's a piece to it for some reason. Yeah. I, I like watching it, watching the nice pools, nice me scenery, too. all the stuff that I'm not going to be able to buy. There's a new one on Netflix, Selling Beverly Hills. Highly recommend. Yes, I watched that okay. too. But there's some of these, there's some of these, uh, I don't know if it's that particular show, but Million Dollar Listening, but it always makes me so frustrated because it's t- a couple and she's like, I'm a part time waitress in a diet. And he's a long haul trucker, and they have a budget of five million dollars. Oh, like no, how? That's what happens? I hate when that happens. That's like the HGTV shows. Million yeah. listing is just I'm a record label yeah. person. I'm an NBA uh, player. Yeah. I'm Cameron Diaz. Yeah, 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 yeah that's so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not yeah. saying there's anything wrong with those professions. I'm just saying, how yeah. do they get a budget this big? Yeah, no, no. These guys, they have the money for these houses, but that the, their formula is just they just sit at a restaurant and they fake battle over the price and it always gets sold in the end. But the people actually legitimately have the money, the money for the houses that they're buying. I'm Unless not people out of yeah, yeah, no, all those people. <laughs> yeah, they work weird. in TV, not radio. They right. did a yeah. whole season on eBay, <laughs> in multiple <laughs> houses now. In buying eBay. Yeah. I think he's on next season. <laughs> Picking out a prison cell. <laughs> they should make him the Bachelor. Buying a casino. <laughs> 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 You guys want more sports stuff or no? Uh, more bachelor? That, that wasn't sports? No. Uh, Caitlin <laughs> it's Clark, all sports according to these people. Caitlin Clark and Iowa blew a 10-point lead through three quarters. They made just one field goal in the fourth, but they still beat West Virginia 64-54 to return to the Sweet 16. And EJ's Gonzaga in the Sweet 16 for the first time since 2015 thanks to a 77-66 win over Utah. We still have not heard from Justin Jefferson since Kirk Cousins left for Atlanta, but Vikings head coach Kevin O'Connell says the internal lines of communication have been open. Justin knows that uh, you know, the situation with Kirk played out in a way that uh, I think the Minnesota Vikings uh, are in a, a situation moving forward. We're excited to build around people like Justin, people like Jordan Addison, TJ Hawkinson. Um, in the quarterback position, he's always going to play a role in that because the skill sets that we're looking for will be guys that can feature who we believe to be the best receiver in football, which Justin is. At the yeah, m- he's a cowboy by next week. Yeah, at the moment. Wait, hold on. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you gave $10 million to Sam Darnold. <laughs> when has Sam Darnold ever shown that he can deliver a football to these types of types of players. There's no chance the line of communication has been uh, <laughs> as fruitful as he's making it sound. Yeah, those are just messages he's left on, on Justin that's, Jefferson's that's, phone. That's right. That's right. Weird. He's, he keeps going to voicemail. He's it's funny. texting him YouTube clips of J.J. McCarthy as we speak, though. Try to, like everybody's trying to sell J.J. McCarthy. While he's watching Million Dollar Listing. <laughs> I was going to say, or while he's watching, I don't know, clips of Aaron Rodgers. Oh, man. Who knows? Uh, the Vikings, by the way, did get that second first round pick recently, fueling the idea that they could move up for a quarterback. The Giants right now sit at number six. Maybe they use that on a quarterback. They do have the green light. Owner John Mara saying yesterday, if GM Joe Shane thinks they should take a quarterback, he doesn't mind it, although he still does believe in Daniel Jones. Guys, back to you. You know, Bogus, you're a Giant fan around here. Yeah. I, I, I was saying to these guys, I think John Mara's got a little flavor of the month type of stuff. Which is funny because they had this long run with Eli and a long run with Tom Coughlin. And ever since then, it's like he can't decide on anybody. They've blown it on head coaching hires. We'll see if Dayball sticks. But they've blown it on three head coaching hires in a row. Mm -hmm. And now they blew it with Daniel Jones by A, reaching for him, B, paying him, and now C, trying to find his replacement I think John Mara's got this wandering eye thing going on. Like, they don't know what's which wet end is up. Yeah, it's not. I mean, and they've been bad for a long time now. Like, right. the, the the one playoff trip is the exception to a decade of mediocrity. Yeah, the trip. Yeah. Uh, no, the one two years ago was Minnesota. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Like, that's I a, forgot that's about That's a blip that. on the radar yeah. of crap, basically, for, for the Giants. Well, it gets remembered more that the Vikings were a non-serious one seed than that the Giants yeah. were a great seven seed. But they were still in the postseason. Yeah. Everything else, though, has been nonsense. And I think Dable's good. I I think more that Shane is good. And Daniel Jones is replaceable. I just don't want J.J. McCarthy to be the, the replacement. Got it. That's my fear is that they just reset the Daniel Jones mm. Yeah. Clock with J.J. McCarthy. Actually, J.J. McCarthy's just Daniel Jones version 2.0. Yeah, it's kind of similar if you're a police sketch artist this thing. Not that they look alike, but like, well, oh, is, he, is he athletic? Yes. Can he run? Yes. Does he have a good arm? Yes. Oh, there is no... That, those two quarterbacks did not exactly have the same backgrounds. Daniel Jones was a Duke quarterback. J.J. McCarthy was like the number one recruit yeah. in the country. And Duke let him throw the football. Yeah, but it was Duke. No, I know. I'm just... Listen, have, have you not been... 
having your own skepticism about J.J. McCarthy this entire show with all the love. I just don't I don't yeah, think yeah, he's yeah. worth this. But he's a very day. different person than Daniel Jones. I'm sure he is, and hopefully he's a better singer at country concerts, too, because Daniel <laughs> Jones keeps doing that <laughs> unnecessarily. Um, but I just don't think he's Justin Herbert in comparison to Daniel Jones. I think J.J. McCarthy is closer to being the same Daniel Jones frustrations, good but not great, not elite. He doesn't, I don't think, I, my... I don't think he solves Ooh. that problem for them yeah. is, in a drastic is, way. Is Daniel Jones good? Yeah, Daniel Jones. He got is, paid off a 15 touchdown season in 2023. Daniel Jones is good. He's a good quarterback. He's not a great quarterback, and he's not one that you wouldn't take a quarterback at number six for. He so, forced. He forced their hands. Well, he played well. Yeah. Yeah. And and got the contract when they should probably should have paid Saquon instead of Daniel Jones at that time. Here's nope. the thing. He yeah. was go- good only, and I'll we might be able to debate about that, but also injury, I- injury prone, which is he runs and he gets hurt. Daniel and that's Jones, not good. He also has this very convenient situation where because he never got great weapons around him, correct. you can always argue away his numbers right. being unimpressive. Uh, well, thank you guys very much. Appreciate that. Coming up, lots more to do, including we do have an update on the Maggie and Perloff one-hit wonders bracket. Who has moved on to the Sweet 16 in the Weddings region? Get that very important information to you in just moments. Don't move. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remain. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining.
One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. It's been a busy day. We had a Shohei Otani press conference to react to. Perloff all in believes Otani thinks that he wouldn't have staked this, you know, been so direct and really staked out his innocence if there was any gray area. Like he's oh, taking yeah. a big risk in some ways. If any of this story doesn't end up coming true, he opens himself up for an incredible amount of criticism. Absolutely. It was cut and dry what he said. He said, I've never bet on sports. So if that's not true, I think there'd be a way to find that out. I still want questions answered from Otani. I want to know how did the translator have access to his bank accounts? I want to know how did he really have no idea the guy was gambling? Even if it's not debts, how do you not know your best friend and your brother has this, you know, sports betting side to himself? It just doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Also, how do you not notice $500,000 in multiple wire transfers? So we still have questions for Otani. We got breaking news during the show that kickoffs are now changed in the NFL to model the XFL model. I mean, this is going to look wildly different. Yeah, I mean, it's supposed to be for safety because the teams are not running at full speed down the field against each other. Last year, only 21% of kicks were returned. Now we'll see more of that. I got to admit, it's kind of fun. The fact that the XFL is like, this is too stupid. It got rid of it. It's a little, <laughs> little interesting. It does feel like a spring football league thing. It does not look like, you know, something the shield would go for. I give them credit for thinking outside the box. Or taking someone else's uh, outside the box thinking and adopting it for yeah, their own. Technically, but yes. yes. Uh, and then we also got this very important news, which is the first region of the Maggie and Perloff one hit wonder bracket is now on to the Sweet 16. So let's just play a couple of the winners, shall we? Who is moving on to the Sweet 16 of the Maggie and Perloff one-hit wonder bracket? How about 16-seeded Tainted Love, the Cinderella story? Okay, so Tainted Love beat out nine-seeded the Macarena, Perloff. I know you were devastated by that. In what is one of the closest matchups of the second round, Jump Around takes out Ice Ice Baby. I came to get down, so get down to seat and jump around. Jump around. Jump around. Jump around. Jump up, jump up and get down. Just a couple tenths of a percent decided that one. Uh, also moving on, the one of the darlings of our tournament, 11 seated Funky Town is out. Whoop, there it is, moves on. And 
get the point. By the <laughs> finally, way. are you sure? Got a couple more. <laughs> And finally, another Cinderella of this region, 15 seated, pump up the jam over Teach Me How to Dougie. Okay, so that those are the songs that are moving on to the Sweet 16. If you would like to vote in the last call region of the Maggie and Pearl off March uh, One Hit Wonders bracket, yep. you can do so. You got one seated Baby Got Back, two seated uh, Come On Eileen. You got a lot of heavy hitters still to come. Do you know less lyrics from Whoop There It Is or Who Let the Dogs Out? Because they, uh, those are songs where you only know the chorus. I think I know a little of the of whoop there is tag team back again party up put it some, let's begin. There's all the lyrics to that. <laughs> There's the lyrics, yeah. I now know who let the dogs out though because I did a dramatic reading of who let the dogs out, uh, and that was on Friday. Yeah, as one does. I am impressed by your effort there. You b- butchered the world's words completely. I'm, actually, there are gigantic lyrics to whoop there it is. <laughs> it's not tag team back <laughs> again. Uh, tag tag team. We're kicking the floor, and we're going to do it something like this. Tag team, twist to the right. Uh, I don't know. There's actually a ton of lyrics. <laughs> well, we'll be back to butcher more lyrics tomorrow. Thank you, DJ Stewart. Thank you to Pete Pilati, Andrew Bogish, Andrew Kaplan, the Weedos. See you.